for. So I, I do plan to have coffee with them and listen to their concerns. I will forward my notes after I hear from them. Councilor Spinner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, ironically, I bet us uh, something that might not come as a surprise. Um, the feedback and conversations I'm having with with people are quite the opposite, and they'd like to see this move rapidly, and they're excited to have this project come too. And and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be good neighbors, but um, but I I hear a completely different set of input about this project, and I'm very excited about it. Um, first, I want to thank um, Mindy, the the advisory committee, and um, and both of you that are here for making an effort to be inclusive with our Spanish speaking population. I think that they're often lost in our community conversations about where our community is heading. And I just want to acknowledge and tell you how much I appreciate that you made that extra effort um, to engage them in this process. Um, so my question is, uh, it sounds like we have time, but you know, should we proceed? When can this happen? I have people that are already excited to get down there and explore this trail and and uh, so what, what kind of timeline are we actually looking at in terms of getting, say, phase one open to the public? Mike, do you want to tackle that one or? Um, I mean, a big part of that is going to come from the funding. So when the funding's available, but as far as the level of design, um, uh, one of the other parts of the other phase one too is uh, one of the larger areas we need to work through is the slide area and developing what kind of um, how we're going to mitigate that and whether that's going to be a rebuild of that or a realignment. Um, and with that, there you know be some potential uh, if we if we um, actually realign around the slide area and looking at some potential right of way needs. So those would all kind of add to that time frame. But uh, the biggest thing is really setting up that initial funding um, to advance the next phase. But uh, you know, once that's in place, uh, right away would probably take the most time out of out of that relative to design, and then also um, as well with the public process. I mean, there's a still a lot of that that needs to move forward and work through uh, addressing uh, public concerns and trying to meet the you know get the, all those uh, amenities as noted by folks, you know, uh, trail users and and also residents as well. So, does that answer your question? Um, I appreciate that the, the question is complex, but I'm not really sure I have a sense of even in a broad and, and general and non-specific sense of what that timeline looks like. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that it's complex and there's no like two years, three years, not like that. But it do you know, let's say we acquire funding. Once we acquire funding, funding, is there like even an estimate on how long we anticipate it would take? I <laughs> Yeah, so on something like this, so so once the funding's in place, you know, if the um, the trail design plan was proceeding forward, like I said, the public involvement would be a, a major piece of that. But it could be done with, you know, design could be done within nine months to a year, depending on how much right of way is involved in that. And then construction, you know, the the first sections where you don't have a lot of the structures, that can be fairly quick construction. I mean, you'd time that to be done seasonally, um, you know, maybe two or three months, depending on what section is built out and what is done. So you know. Okay. That kind of brackets it a little bit. So we're not necessarily talking about a decade. That's what I, I hear people that would like to get on it while they're still able to ride their bikes. <laughs> so, so. That's so. a common thing we hear on the Salmonberry. I'm, I'm involved in that project as well. And so that is a decade project because it's 80 miles and, and that funding is not in place. But yeah, no, this is this would, it, depending on how it takes funding, this could be, you know, you could see, you could be out there within two to five years or less, depending on funding. That's fantastic. Thank you for all Actually, your work. If I, if I could add a little bit to that too, from uh, my perspective here, this is, this is Scott, um, to uh, Councillor Spoon's uh, inquiry there. I think, you know, kind of even pulling back a little bit and, and looking at this as the bigger picture, um, th this is exactly why we're uh, coming to you tonight, Council, is a progress report, if you will, on this um, planning process that has a lot of layers of complexity in terms of, you know, what, <clears throat> what it looks like and, and how it gets designed and so forth, but also what is our, um, what is our priority to look at, you know, funding and managing this um, council? Do you wish us to proceed down this path? Uh, pardon the pun. Uh, you know, really, this is like a check-in with you to say where we're at. Um, is this, is this something you want us to expend city staff time and resources continue to expend time on? Um, the nice thing is this, um, this uh, first 
design project was funded mostly by a grant. So we've spent some staff time, but really it's been volunteer based with our committee and, and some staff time, but it's been funded by a grant. But then we start getting into the construction and then ultimately the management. So I think we've got some bigger picture things we'll have to sort out at some point in terms of is this managed by the city or is it managed by some, you know, coalition of, of you know, private public partnerships or, or whatever. And, and so um, yeah, I just want to I just want to make sure that that's part of the discussion or understanding. We're not going to solve those questions tonight. This isn't meant to be that in depth of a discussion this evening. And we can certainly bring this back to you. But um, just wanted to put that out there that we I think this warrants some of those types of further conversations as we continue to move forward. Well, then I guess the rest of my question is in terms of timing the relationship between, I mean, I'm a fan of this project. I'd like to see us move forward. It's important that we continue the community engagement and resolve some of those issues. I'm, I'm all on board with that as part of it. Um, but I'm more like, what's the relationship between this and the park master plan? It feels weird to say, let's go when we're just starting a parks master plan process too. And I, you know, so hopefully there'd be, I assume you're indicating there'd be a marriage between the two and yeah. we could say, go ahead and proceed and continue the community engagement but we're not like we're not we can't go full in on anything in my opinion until we have the master plan is that where you're at scott oh, totally agree yeah, yeah i actually wanted to say that and i forgot to say that part of it the master plan is a big part the park's master plan is is a big consideration and i think this um is something we can just fold into that conversation uh so um and, and you know determining what the community's priorities are and you know to continue that, that engagement forward so yeah thank you for that point but i absolutely think this should be part of that discussion um and also uh, on that um, the can be visioning plan um from 2013 which i outlined at the beginning did show that as being one of our top priorities and more important or also as the parks master plan is being revamped, they've been kind enough to invite the bike ped committee to be on the steering committee, a representative from. And so we'll be working with them on that. And in the previous parks plan, um, the uh, uh, extension of the logging road was in the previous plan, but that was from ages ago. So anyhow, also just to let you know, um, it's on the county active transportation plan and the county TSP also. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, this isn't just a brainchild out of the blue. So um, it is in a lot of plans and hopefully will continue to be. Thanks. Councilor Varwig, then Councilor Tibbles. Yeah, thank you. I think my questions were, were mostly answered in the last dialogue, but my questions were going to be, A, is this included, going, going to be included in the Parks Master Plan? You guys answered that question, but um, the other question was around funding and how, how are we going to fund it? And so I think that's probably a question, Scott and Calvin, that you're going to be asking us as much as we're asking you. So um, I, I don't think that's an answerable question at this time. Um, I, I definitely want to uh, have that discussion very soon to make sure that we can fund this and that it's not, you know, I'm not a huge fan of going into a, a whole lot of debt to do it. Um, and so I'd love to see what the options are um, for funding and if there's any kind of uh, additional grant options to get to help fund it. Yeah, before going to uh, Jordan, I will say, Councilor Varg, that uh, a lot of the uh, C4, sorry, Clackamas County Coordinating Committee with um, STIP and uh, plan, uh, fundage that is out there. Um, there's quite a bit that is going to be going to um, trails and pathways. And so that is an opportunity for us to put this project um, and projects like it around our city into that, uh, that process to see if there's grant money um, or uh, let's say grant money coming from that, that portion of the uh, the state funds. If I can interject quickly, the um, we the city has been awarded a National Park Service grant for uh, rivers, trails, conservation, and I forgot what the A is, but it's an RTCA grant. It's not a uh, financial grant, 
it's not a funds grant, but it is a, um, a technical grant in helping us to figure out what agencies might need to come together to um, make things happen and where to find funding. So we will be getting some technical assistance um, that we were just informed of that last week, I think. So. Great. Uh, Councillor Tibbles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I guess the, the one question I have is what has been the general uh, sentiment and feedback from the police community as well as all uh, in general first responders of what kind of resources and challenges this project would uh, would bring up and, and kind of I know you said it would be a shared between Clackamas County and, and Canby but uh, I just wanted to see if you could you could speak to that specifically of how that relationship would work and also their their risks and, and uh, resource allocation to be able to take it on. Actually, Mayor, if, if I if you recognize me, I, I spoke directly to the sheriff about this. Okay, Councilor Parker. Uh, Jordan, that was one of my first concerns. Uh, that in talking to the uh, adjacent property owners, uh, uh, safety was was a key concern. And uh, uh, following her election, I talked to uh, Angie Brandenburg uh, about this, what the trail was, where it was. She was aware of it. And, and she said in future conversations like this, that I could quote her as saying uh, that there is no reason to let concerns over police safety and first responder inhibit our ability to develop a public amenity. She said that uh, public safety and the unincorporated area is her responsibility and uh, it, it would be her duty to make sure this worked and uh, that, that, that she would take the lead in working with other first responders and can be police. So the sheriff was unequivocal in that uh, any public safety concerns she would take care of directly and answer the questions, but not to let those issues uh, get in the way of developing a public amenity next to the river. Uh, also at the stakeholder committee meeting, um, uh, George Tro said that uh, he loved the logging trail and they would be totally on board with coordinating with the county and also um, same response from uh, can be fire, so. Okay, thank you, Greg and Mindy. And I guess just to follow up to that, did they like, are we even at the point where they would uh, kind of give you a plan in terms of patrolling and frequency and what that would look like as a maintenance or is that an ongoing thing down the road? I'm taking it from the head nod. That's where I'm jumping the gun. Sorry, that's the <laughs> military mind in me. So I'll ask those questions later. Thanks, Councilor Tibbles. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Bangs and then Councilor Spoon. Uh, thank you. I had a question about um, the, the land ownership, but, but first I will point out, just because I think it's relevant here, that I'm on that jogging trail or that logging road um, many times a week. And I've never um, once seen any Canby police on it. Um, <clears throat> so, so I'm not certain to, to what extent um, we are patrolling at all on, on those trails. I've not seen any issues either other than um, graffiti. But uh, my question is involving land ownership. So th this is going to be an extended section of Canby ownership stretching out from the city well beyond our urban growth boundary is there an issue with that? Is is that okay? I'm totally in favor of this plan. I love it. But um, does this get us into any kind of legal issues involving controlling and, and owning land that's not in our city limits? Okay. There's no development planned. I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, and I'll look over my shoulder to Mr. Lindsay in case he wants to add anything. But um, I've got extensive experience with this subject matter and um, the, there's nothing um, that prevents our jurisdiction from owning property outside of our boundary. 
uh, it really um, you know, becomes a policy decision about managing that asset what we want to do with it and, and whether we want to be the, the managers of something that extends, you know, in this case, uh, portions of this extend well beyond our city limits or even our urban growth boundaries. So it's an excellent question. And uh, again, I think that goes back to what I was saying a bit ago is this is an ongoing discussion we'll want to have with you council that it really is, um, we're going to, it is going, it's a policy decision. It's, you know, um, investment in, uh, the development and the ongoing uh, management of an asset. And there's nothing that really prevents us from having property outside of our boundaries. So I think it's a question of the, the value to our, our Canby residents and our, and our you know, tax paying citizens. Excellent, Scott, thank you. This is Joe Lindsay. Is, you know, we received this uh, and now own it. Um, and, I guess to reiterate a point earlier, right? We just because we own it doesn't mean it has to be open to the public. It can be publicly owned, but not open to the public. But it is a bit of a liability to own land. And so we own land, and so we have to be stewards of it, but we also have to make sure that if we have known um, traps or, or known dangers in our own land ownership, and we even if we don't have invitees out there, if we have trespassers and it becomes kind of that um, the uh, attractive nuisance idea, uh, we, we do have a bit of liability in not using our land and actually uh, advancing it to the point where it doesn't have dangers on it. So that's another flip side of land ownership, just so you know. So we have liability if we don't do the project as well? Yes. So long as we own the property, yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Councilor Spoon and Councilor Parker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple of things. One was about funding um, in regards to Sean's project. When I went, th or a question, uh, when I went through the packet, like on page 30, bottom of 33 and thir top of 34 of the very large packet we have, it establishes the funding. Now, I assumed when I read this that um, segment 1A and 1B would probably done be done in a similar timeline, and then segment 2 could be done at a later date, and segment 3 at a later date because there are unique challenges among that. So another thing to keep in mind in terms of the cost of the project from my perspective, and someone else, you know, keep me in check if I'm wrong, is that we we don't, not all the expenses come at once with phase, that's one of the beauties of phase projects, right, that, that the cost of phase 1 is a fraction of the total of that $5.6 million. It's not the totality of it. So in terms of funding, it's actually an ideal project because it allows us to open up access, see what the community thinks about it as, as it gains popularity. And as we have opportunities to see how successful it is or isn't with the community, we can phase in additional funding for additional phases. So it's actually given community concerns that exist about every project. It's kind of an ideal project that way, both funding wise and in terms of community input. Um, another thing uh, what's kind of along the lines with what Joe said is from my perspective, while everyone's always worried about, worried about public safety on um, publicly owned land, it's probably actually safer I mean, I don't know how often many of you use the logging road, but I was telling the story, I think last time to you, I used the logging road. Uh, the last time I counted at 9.30 on a Tuesday, I counted 52 people going one direction. It's heavily used. And I think that would continue out past the gun club. It's not like it would be a, a very lightly used trail. I think it would be a heavily used trail, which, which helps with safety. It's actually, in my perspective, a bigger risk undeveloped uh, for both crime, trespassing, all of that um, injury, uh, then it would be comparatively developed because our logging road, in my opinion, and I know another one or two of you have expressed this too, is our most widely and heavily used park and actually developing it and having all that activity is better for public safety from my perspective. So just a couple of other thoughts about that. Thank you. Councilor Parker. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I did want to bring us back to um, how very special this is, um, that this is a project that was not started by a bureaucrat or a politician. Uh, this was a citizen-driven project. And not just a citizen-driven project, they went out and got the money, $35,000, 
uh, to conduct uh, an excellent first phase. So, you know, this is what every city in the country wants to have, is a citizen involvement program that is so robust uh, that uh, the city policymakers are running to catch up with it. And uh, I know I've talked to the mayor and city manager for a while. I said, you know, we really do need to get this in front of the council uh, because we've got some people that are working very hard on this. Uh, Jordan, to your point, uh, yes, public safety is is going to be critical. I'm going to be watching that. I'll bring you on as a co-partner uh, on that as uh, uh, we get down to that point. Um and, and Tim Dale's no longer with us on the council. He's still very robust. Uh, but he would say of a thing like this, that um, it's good for us to plant a seed for a tree that we will not rest under. And for some of this, some of us, uh, this may be a project that we will not see to fruition. Um, but for many years, I lived in uh, the city of Salem and occasionally walk down to this blackberry patch mess, awful place, and uh, look over the blackberries to the Willamette River. And we got a citizens committee started, and uh, 10 years later, 10 years later, uh, the uh, Riverside Park opened up. So these are things that take a, a while. Um, the good news is, uh, we've got the perfect city manager for this. This is somebody uh, who who understands the logistics uh, of operating something. So to bring this around to full loop where I think staff wants us to be is uh, what do we want you guys to do? Uh, so my opening bid is this is something I would like us to keep pursuing, uh, keep on top of. See how this integrates into the uh, Park Master Plan. And at the conclusion of the Park Master Plan, have this presented back to us for uh, decision points. Um, that uh, things, as, as this progresses, the decisions that we have to make uh, will become clearer. The question tonight is, do we want staff to continue uh, to pursue this? And so my vote is yes. Thank you, Councilor Parker. Any other comments or questions uh, regarding this right now? Councilor Bangs? I would just also uh, support this project and moving forward with it. I, I don't know if that was clear. It certainly meant it to be clear, but I'm also a solid yes on moving forward with this. Okay. Yeah, it's a great project. I mean, it, uh, Mindy um, into the bike and pick committee. Thank you very much for um, continuing to drive this and, and be a force behind it. This is great. Um, if we, it is, it's, it's beautiful um beautiful country beautiful path out that direction and there's a tremendous about a, amount of potential that that has um for um biking uh equestrian and you know i was reading in there too because i know that's something that you know great opportunity for horseback riding and whatnot so um there's a lot more yet to come and, and to be worked on and i think in folding this into the um, park master plan um is going to be a, a big part um, of seeing this get the funding and, and move it forward. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be a key next step for sure. So, um, Councillor Spoon, did you have something else? Yeah, just a question for staff. I think it's clear that I'm on the same page as Greg and Chris, but um, maybe an idea as we move it forward, as we get past the Parks Master Plan, is if we could... Um, as a group safely go visit it, the people that are interested and see it, I think that would really open people's eyes to what this can be. I mean, I grew up here, I spent some afternoons there. Um, and so it's, I, I think that you kind of need to see it <laughs> to really have a, have a whole picture of what it could be. And so my ask would be that after we get through the parks master plan that maybe the next decision point, there'd be an opportunity for us to go see parts of it as a group, if that's okay. Yep, that's a great idea. 
We could we could make that happen. Okay. The staff can put that together. Councillor Tibbles. Yeah, um, I just to kind of say where I'm at on it. I, I am um, in support of it uh, continuing to be pursued. I would. My one comment would be that a little bit um, more of a robust security and uh, first responder plan towards the beginning uh, versus later because I would kind of want to know what those risks, risks are before the costs go into it in the different phases and knowing that up front. But in general, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see that um, that help, you know, the, the outdoor scene, the, the, the joggers, the runners, the... I think it's a great project, um, but I would want to know all those things because there are risks associated with it and so that everyone felt comfortable moving forward. So that would be my one one note. I agree, Jordan. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, to the consultant group, thank you very much for your work on this. This is a, a the level of detail and in, in, uh, projection outward, as Councilor Parker pointed out, of you know, um, what could be con um, completed here within a reasonable time frame is very much appreciated. It's a great, great plan. So thank you for um, the due diligence on it. And, and uh, I know that we there will be more to come on, on this as we dive into some of those pieces that were brought up this evening. So thank you both for being here tonight and for presenting. This is great. Thanks so much for having us. Really appreciate it. It was really great working with all of you. So. Great, great. Mindy, thank you as well. Keep it up. All right, um, we're going to segue now into um, a conversation on the street maintenance fee. Um, and Scott, I'll let you take that over. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so for for time's sake, um, we've got a little over a half hour before the regular meeting is supposed to start. Um, so Julie Blums, our finance director, is joining me up here at the table. Um, Jerry Nelzine is also here just uh, for helping us with any questions that might come up. Um, as I think most of you are aware, the, the street maintenance fee um, was established in 2008. Um, the current rate that was set, uh, the $5 for a single family residential um, home on a monthly basis uh, has not changed since that point in time. And so there's been some discussion about, do we want to make any modifications to that? Um, and um, so this, this, uh, uh, this discussion with you this evening is based on uh, feedback on, on a number of occasions that you were interested in having some further discussion about our street, street fee uh, maintenance program. Um, what we'd like to do is Julie's going to walk you through a presentation of uh, kind of where we've been and where we're at, what this provides, and perhaps some uh, options for you to consider. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you can um, ask us questions and we'll be happy to help uh, provide any information. Um, we may we may need to, uh, I think that first conversation about the trail uh, was, uh, was an excellent one and uh, was a little bit longer than anticipated. So we may need to uh, put some additional time on another work session if, if needed and we'll be happy to do that. But we'll at least get this information presented to you tonight and kind of get you started on the conversation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julie. Good evening, Mayor Council. So I normally talk fast. I'm going to talk really fast. So um, oh, sorry, we're our uh, configuration is a little weird to be able to move the slides. So here we go. Okay, so um, as Scott had said, the street maintenance fee was uh, created back in January of 2008, and um, it was created to maintain and repair and reconstruct city streets. Um, it, and that includes, you know, the actual construction and overlays. It includes the administrative functions that need to be done along with that. Um, and uh, any monitoring, assessment, um, review of, of the streets themselves. And just for Jason Padden, between the curbs. <laughs> so I know that you can all read this, um, but this is a map 
of all of the streets that have already been paved with the street maintenance money from 2008 through 2021, and it's 31.5 center line miles. And that means, <clears throat> excuse me, that's an entire street. So lane miles is, you would basically double it because it's both sides of the street. So this is, um, the a chart of what our pavement condition index means. And what this, what a pavement condition index is, is they rate your streets based on, you know, are there cracks, are there potholes, just the, the level of um, quality of the street. So if you get a PCI of 100, your street's excellent. You don't need to do anything to it. Um, and as you can see, the, the ratings uh, go down, and this chart shows, oops, it didn't move, sorry, there we go. So in 2018, we hired a company to come in and do a full review of all of our streets in town, 54.03 uh, center line miles, and what they came back with is that the average PCI for our streets was 75. And they put together some uh, cost packages depending on what level we wanted for maintenance. So the first column there uh, is what we're currently spending on average per year, $670,000. And after a five-year period, that would result in us actually going backwards. And we would have an average PCI of 72. To just maintain the current 75, we would need to spend at least a million dollars a year. If we wanted to increase it, um, there's two options there. One, if we go up five points to an 80, um, that would require just under $2 million a year. And if we went to an 84, it would require about $3 million a year. Now, 84 is what the industry recommends that you set your, your PCI goal to, um, but that is something that we haven't quite gotten to uh, here and We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of slides. So this is uh, the average life of a road. So when you pave it, the average life is about 17 years. If you have some sort of maintenance program, if you don't have a maintenance program, it cuts the life of your year or the life of your road almost in half. So instead of it lasting 17 years, you're going to be paving it again in eight to 10 years, and then again at the 17, 18 year mark. And it, on average, it costs about $15 a square yard to pave and do an overlay on a road. And a maintenance program, which would include some sort of slurry program, um, the kind that we have done in the past on like city property is called a micro slurry. And I'm not gonna get into the details of it because it's way over my head, but Jerry says it's really good stuff. It's better than what most cities use and it doesn't create the, the road gunk that, um, most people don't like with the slurry seals. But if you do that every six to eight years, it's only $3.70 a square yard, but it keeps your road twice as long. So there is a cost benefit there to having some sort of maintenance program. So the street fee rates, as Scott said, 
everybody thinks of them, they're $5 per month. Well, that's true for residential. There's different rates depending on multifamily, senior housing, uh, that sort of thing. And then for non-residential, it's based on trips, which every res uh, non-residential business has a trip calculator. We use it in SDCs as well. And so they, they pay based on the number of trips that people, the average number of trips that people would um, use the roads to come to their business each day. Okay, so here's the fun part. So I went back and looked up what the construction cost index was for the last 10, 11 years. And if we had done increases every year based on that construction cost index, which we also use for our SDC increases annually, at this point, we would be at $6.90 per household per month. And we're still down at the $5. What that equates to, so this blue line is what we have uh, brought in in revenue. Had we increased it along the way, we would be at 8.2 million. So we have foregone as much as $1.3 million by not doing any rate increases for the last 12 years. Back in 2008, 2009, when we implemented this, our $5 was worth $5. It is now worth $3.10 um, because cost of materials, labor have gone up, but our fee has not gone up. So we can't buy as much with that $5 as we could back in 2009. So this is some options for you. This is the crux um, that we've been talking about for a few years, I guess. What do we do? What's the right increase, if anything? So I put together several options or scenarios for you, and these aren't set in stone. You can you know, run whatever scenario you would like, but if we continued at $5 annually, over the next five years, we would bring in just over $3 million. So not much more than what we have been. If we did an increase based on the construction cost index every year from here forward, it would go up to about 3.4 million over five years. Um, if we did another scenario where we just added a quarter every year, it would bring us up to about 3.6 million. So, you know, it, it's helping, but we're still not getting there. So I ran numbers. If we started with the base being where we could have been, the $6.90, and did annual increases based on the construction cost index, which I estimated to be about two and a half percent. It's an average over time. Then that would bring us up to about four and a half million dollars over five years. Now to get us to the option where we are just keeping steady at the 75, we would have to set that rate at $7.75 and then do annual increases as well. So there's lots of options. Um, the, the biggest question is, as a council, what do you want to set the target for the PCI to be that we're working towards? Because that is really what's going to drive how we get there, how much we need to, to raise in revenue um, to, to be able to accomplish that. 
like I said, the industry standard recommends 84. Um, a lot of cities do anything between 80 and 84. Um, we've seen everything in between that. So um, I don't, I'm not asking you to make a decision tonight because this is a lot of information in a very short period of time. But this was really meant to put before you some, some information to help you kind of digest and get a sense of what it is going to take for us to keep our roads maintained. And do we want to start looking at some sort of maintenance program? Because if we don't, these costs are going to be probably another two thirds higher over the same period of time without a maintenance program. I'm done talking. <laughs> and just again, to be clear, uh, I'll add one more thing, Council. Um, and yes, we just wanted to present this information to begin a conversation with you. Um, when Julie says, uh, do we want to have a maintenance program? That is, instead of waiting every, um, as she discussed about an average of 17 years to do a full replacement or an overlay, um, do we want to consider adding that interim step of doing a, um, a mic, uh, the, the slurry seal or a micro seal program, which we uh, don't currently use on our public roads. We use those in maybe uh, driveways and parking lots, but not, not so much on our public roads. And that's a way we could uh, extend the life of our roads. So that's, that's a consideration as well. So a uh, question I have is how quickly does the road deteriorate if we're at 75 versus 85? Like how quickly does the PCI uh, deteriorate? Gotcha. Um, the, the study that was done said that once it reaches a level of poor, let me check, go back to that slide. Um, Here we go. So once it hits at a level of fair, the, it, the drop off steepens. So it's an additional 40%. So the lower it gets, the quicker it gets degraded. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. But I mean, that, but I, I get that. So I guess it just, it's a matter of looking at that at 75 to 85, like in that window, if we stay in there, you know, is that is that so, maintenance versus redoing? Right. The the fair um, grouping is a 60, 50 to 69. So if we want to stay above that, we need to be somewhere between a 70 and a hundred to keep it above that steep drop off of a 40%. Um, the, the other issue is this study was done in 2018 and we haven't, and it was based on the recommendation of doing a maintenance program. So Jerry and I were talking about this and, you know, in the next year or so, year and a half, we probably need to do this again and ask them to give us costs based on having a maintenance plan and not having, you know, some sort of slurry plan so that we know you guys have good information of how much it's going to cost under each scenario. Okay. Um, Councilor Spoon and then Councilor Parker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Julie. A uh, few questions. I'll try and get through them quickly. One, can we get a copy of this PowerPoint? There's some information I'd like to digest uh, at a little bit slower pace than we had to go for this. Yeah. And it wasn't in the packet. Um, yeah, I, it just got finished today, so. Okay. So yes, you can we'll, we'll get you a copy. Great. Uh, on the slide that shows the the one that we're looking at, the cost per square yard, um, one, do do we do the micro slurry ourselves, or do we contract that work out? 
Jerry says it would be contracted out. Okay. So is that dollar per square yard is not the cost of the ingredients, not the ingredients, the materials. We're not eating the roads. Um, the materials to to pave the roads. That's the total cost contracted out, including labor and everything. That's not just materials. Jerry says that is everything. Awesome. Okay. And then um, where, Jerry, could you, because I have never paved anything before. I made a patio, but I didn't use my grocery. slurry. Um, could you maybe tell me or email me later a place where I can go see? I just, I want to understand what it is and how it's different than what we do to our roads. <laughs> could you maybe give me an idea of where I could go see some? I just want some context for what that is and how it's different. The, the best place to see where the product would be using would be public works um, in okay. our shop. Road. We haven't you. done, we've, we've, uh, and just to, to, reiterate on the paving on that our we got this funding in the right time and we've been playing catch up and so the overlays uh we've been doing around three miles a year or so of overlays and once in a while throwing a slurry seal in and you know how that's all gone you guys have gotten pretty beat up over them and and I, I don't think the right material was used. I don't think you guys, we were educated enough at the time. But right now, we're starting to get caught up on our roads. You can see we're in a 75, and maintaining them is a good deal. Yep. But maintaining with uh, some sort of maintenance program would be smart. But, Sarah, if you want to take a look at the material we uh, we have down there, anytime you want to drop in, I can show you what, we're, what we yeah. use. And I can actually show you the materials that I have left over of what goes into it. That'd be awesome. Maybe I'll just shoot you an email and I can hop out there. Uh, I, ju I just want some better context because I like to have an idea of what I'm, what the difference is. But um, yeah. my last question is you, it seems like towards the end, you gave us some, some general ideas of how the pricing could be changed, including the index. Um, is, could you go to that slide for a minute? The last one. Oh, the very last one. Yeah. That had the pricing. Yeah. So is, yeah, is there a place, I mean, I always want to be conscientious of how, um, you know, $3 a month is significant to some people, especially if we had the CC and I, and, and I want to be conscious of that. And obviously we'd have a public hearing and get input if we went this way, but um, is there somewhere between where we are now and going immediately to the 690? Like, would there be an option to maybe do an incremental increase, like a dollar plus the CCI adjustment every year until we get caught up? Or, or can we at least explore that if, if we're going to address it again? If, if anyone else is interested in something more incremental? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm open-minded to what the answer is here. I think that I there is, there is one thing that ties our entire city together, and that's a desire for nice streets. I think we've all experienced that on, on council. Everyone wants good streets and and I'm willing to take the steps necessary and make sure we can continue that. But maybe I guess um, with public input or maybe another incremental option between $5 and $690 plus CCI or $775. Um, if that's not, if that doesn't make sense in terms of how it pans out um, in terms of getting caught up, that's, I, I'll accept that answer too, but. Well, we can, I can run any scenario you would like. Um, I'm willing. <laughs> okay. yeah, I, would, else I definitely can, add, can add, uh, send you guys out what it would look like if we did a dollar per year plus what the inflationary increase yeah. is. So it would be a little more than a dollar each year. Um, I, I would be interested in that, but if no one else is, I'm not going to make you do the work. I'm just, I just kind of want to see what all of our options are in terms of pricing so that when we get public input, they're aware that there's, you know, options available too. And, and that, you know, we've really taken into account the people that, you know, where a few dollars a month makes a huge difference. So right. those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Parker. Well, Julie, I don't think you spoke fast at all tonight. I think you did a splendid job. Um, let me give, let me run this by you. See if this uh, is an accurate summation. Uh, so the more we spend, the less we spend. The, the more we spend, the less. Yes. Yes. Over time. I uh, remember when uh, Danielle Cowan was assistant city manager in um, Wilsonville, and she uh, was in charge of the street project. And she showed me uh, the conclusion of their 10-year program to bring the streets up to 
the highest level, and it dropped her yearly maintenance by 20%. And uh, I said, that's almost magic. And she goes, no, you know, think about your house or your car, uh, that a well-maintained car is going to cost you less than big later on. So um, I, I like the staff report. You did a good job on this. Uh, you gave us targets. Uh, and now we're going to have to see how much we can swallow politically uh, in terms of uh, asking our citizens to support it. Uh, but my, my preference is to find a way for us to get to uh, the top level of maintenance um, because the science is there to show that it will save money. We're going to have to be the ones that take the political hit in the short run for uh, raising the revenues to get us there. And uh, so there's not going to be anybody around in 10 years thanking us on the streets for saying, thanks for doing that, because now we're paying less in uh, uh, maintenance fees. But it it sort of makes sense that uh, if if we if we take the pain now uh, and invest in our roads, uh, then uh, later on, we won't have to spend so much. And and I, I second Sarah's opinion. I mean, that this is a balancing act on 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 how much we, we raise and how fast we raise it. Uh, but I'd like you to present us with a couple of scenarios. What's what is the best scenario for us to get there as fast as we can? And and what's what's the slowest scenario, I guess. So we have a spectrum uh, to choose on. That's all I had, Mayor. Thank you. From, from the report sure. that was done, we, in order to get all our roads up to an 84, it would take $15 million. And again, that's including having a slurry program. So, you know, the last option on this slide just keeps us at the 75. So basically triple that, and that will get us 15 million over five years. And that's a very hard number to swallow. <laughs> um, Councillor Bangs, then Verwig, then Tibbles. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, do we have a, uh, actually, I'm guessing we don't. So Julie, I'm asking if you can give us a, one more piece of information. What is the difference between this CCI, the construction cost index and a consumer price index? My concern is not so much um, the the cost. Well, my, my concern is that the cost of construction will um, inflate at a faster rate than our taxpayers' uh, own income. So, so I wouldn't mind seeing the um, what the difference is between CPI and CCI. I'd hate to have us index it to something that we cannot really afford in the long run. I, I will I add in, in regard to Councillor Spoon's <clears throat> comment. I'm less interested in phasing it in if we go if we go right up to the two six dollars and ninety cents a month we're looking at a tax hit of twenty two dollars or twenty three dollars per family and if we go up to the top market there at at um from from six ninety to seven seventy five we're still looking at a thirty three dollars in one year change so I don't know how how much time we need to phase it in uh, the second question I have is, um, do we have any uh, population projections on the aging of our population? It, it, we have um, people in elderly housing that pay a discounted rate. And if, uh, the, <clears throat> if, the, if the percentage of our population that qualifies for that grows over time, that that'll create a uh, additional problem with our steep street maintenance program. I Simply because they're paying so much less than, than the non-elderly people. Right. I do not have an estimate on that. Um, do we have a source for that? We can, we can see if we can. Wastewater, okay. I believe. We need to look at wastewater. Have um, we, we'll look into how we might be able to do that. Yeah, and I'm not sure how successfully we can forecast that down the road. Uh, in any event, I would like to see what the difference is between CCI and CPI is. You know, I hate for us to have a 
you know, a stagflation situation, but the cost of cost of paving goes skyrocketing and then people are having a hard time maintaining that. Well, I, I will tell you over the life of this program, the average annual in, uh, uh, construction cost index is 2.7 per year. So that sounds um, pretty similar, uh, yeah. perhaps just a little bit higher than CPI. Yes. Thank you, sir. Councillor Varwig, then Councillor Tibbles. Yeah, thanks. Jerry, the uh, micro slurry, how much longer does that extend our roads? Is it a, is it double the length of time before we have to repave them, or is it a, how many, what percentage? It, it depends on when you get it on, you know, but yeah, you could potentially, if it's applied right, you get the right product, you could double the life of it. Um, it's just, we've never been to a point where we could start getting to that point to apply anything like that on a newer subdivision that just got paved. So um, I have to go off of what this uh, report we hired this company to do. So um, just reading their facts and everything else and talking to other cities that have used them too that have applied it, it does buy a lot of time. Yeah, it seems if we can double the life of the roads and for like, you know, 15, 20% of replacing them costs that makes a lot of sense. So I definitely would love to see what, you know, what it would cost to, to do that maintenance program. I think that's a good, a good move. Thank you, sir. Councilor Tibbles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Julie. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation with a a whole bunch of different moving parts and possibilities you would think it would be really you know the possibility of being lost and hard hard to follow i i actually followed it rather um easily and and i thought you articulated it well and and that just made me um one i'm i'm obviously down i'm focused on continuing down the path of what makes the most sense from um, the taxpayer perspective as well as not having such an instant impact but also uh, i believe that as a as a council member and as a citizen, I believe we've all heard our citizens tell us that they want better roads and better quality roads. So I don't know what this, maybe this is a Joe question, but once we decide what that um, rate that makes the most sense and the increase looks like, what does that look like in terms of actually presenting it to the voters versus us deciding this? Um, because- a fee is not a tax, so you do not present it to the voter. It is a decision you can make because it's a fee. It's a, it's a decision we can make right now because it's a fee, but can we make, now that we're talking about amending that to be potentially a higher fee and fixed to something else, could that no longer be a fee and actually a tax uh, that you goes? Have, you have a, a hearing open to the public, but it's a fee, it's not a tax. Right. So, uh, Councillor Tibbles, you will see this in two weeks, but every year we bring forward uh, our master fee schedule to the council for updates. And we do it the, the last meeting in June when we do our budget adoption. And that is where we update any kinds of fees like this. As Joe said, it's not a tax, so we're not required to go to the voters for increases. Um, but that is where we bring forward those fee increases every year. And um, we typically do a public comment period on that so that the public has an opportunity to speak on it. Um, but that'll happen in two weeks. And I know that we are not going to make a decision on this to have this included in the fee schedule for, uh, for June 16th. Um, I, I do not expect that at all, but that is normally how the process would work. Okay. And so can you help me understand Joe with the fee and the tax structure, how it re I guess the little history on how it got designated that way. And did we have the option for it to be considered a tax out of the gates? And that's not the path we went because now we're talking about a sliding value potentially tied to an index and an increase. So it, you know, um, it sure smells a lot like a tax. Yeah. It's just been held that uh, certain programs like this, uh, when you call it a fee and it and it uh, it operates in in a, in a particular way where it's for a particular thing, um, much like your park maintenance fee, uh, that's been allowable uh, under the law as not a tax but a, as a fee. So 
Um, just the way in which it operates, it under law has been held that it's a fee and not a tax. I, we could talk more about that later, um, but the, the case law um, backs it up. And so, uh, you, I mean, you're not alone in that other folks have come in and said, it's government charging me, but we charge for all sorts of things, all sorts of services um, that, that we provide. Uh, and this is one that is allowable under law. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, so allowable, <laughs> but not required. Or oh, it's not required. You could, you could have no fee. Um, you could even have, um, I've, I've seen other jurisdictions have other fees that they charge uh, as part of their bills um, monthly to folks. And we could talk about those too, but I don't, I don't want to. Okay. We can talk. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably, ask you some, <laughs> I'll ask you additional, I'll send you some additional questions just so I have a, a clarification on it. And for time's sake, I've just um, obviously to me that that seems like a, a very, very fine line that really doesn't have a lot of clear definition, but the case law, I'm sure that you could, <laughs> if you have an hour out of your time, I'd probably take the full of it to explain it to me. So I appreciate it. Well, that's cool. We can talk more. And, and, um, and I, that's understandable. We've had folks come in and um, ar argue this in the past, especially after it was uh, inst uh, instituted. So, uh, but it, I, I mean, we also do this for our parks maintenance uh, too. So, just saying. Okay, last question is Councillor Hensley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the fee schedule is largely made up of fees that are optional to the public for options that they want to use. The street maintenance fee and the park maintenance fee is being put on every citizen whether they want it or not. So it is another three letter word for tax. Whether we can do it doesn't mean we should do it. And I'm not going to be for raising this without going to the vote of the people. Okay, we are at um, 7.31. Um, we need to begin our uh, city council meeting. And so um, I think this was a wet the whistle um, work session or it ended up being that way because the first piece took a little bit longer. Um, so what I'm hearing and seeing for the next time we need to bring this back in further conversation is um, what level do we want the PCI to be at um, long term or, um, you know, oscillate in between. And then the maintenance program, i.e. the ad adding of the micro seal piece and then um, the what do we look at in terms of dollars and cents and how do we get to that? point so there's a couple of other pieces coming forward um am i leaving anything off in terms of where we're at currently with this conversation okay i captured it well i tried to um so um when we come back to this conversation topic because this will be coming back quickly because um uh, you know this is a um i view our roads as an asset to our um to our city and yes, people want nice roads to drive on and whatnot. Um, it's about how to get there. So we need to figure that out um, sooner than later as we um, see that $5 is no longer um, keeping things where they're at. And maybe that's okay. Some is better than none. Um, and then we just got to figure out if that's the case, then where else do we go? More to come. Um, so Scott and I will work on the agenda to bring this back as a continued conversation piece on the agenda. Um, Julie, thank you very much. This was a, um, very informative. I appreciate it. Did brought forward what I was hoping it would. And so um, we will circle back and figure out what the next conversation looks like in greater detail. Uh, I'm going to end our work session. Um, counselors, um, do we need, and staff, do we need to take a quick break? Yes, please. Okay. We are going to take a quick break and um, we will reconvene as quickly as say, I've got uh, 7.34 on Cupertino's time. So 7.40, we will convene the city council meeting. Thank you, everyone.
Um, good evening, Cammy. Welcome to the, what is the date today? Wow, June 2nd. Time flies when you're having fun. 2021 um, City Council regular meeting. Um, we apologize for, or I apologize for the delay. Um, we had a very um, in-depth uh, work session here this evening regarding the Malala Forest Road um, plan that's been worked on. So we got an update regarding that. And we also had a very lengthy um, but brief, lengthy and brief, can they be the same thing? We'll say brief and intense conversation about the road maintenance fee with more to come on that. Um, so um, first up on the agenda is citizen input and community announcements. Uh, this is an opportunity for audience members to address um, the city council on items not on the agenda. Um, each person will be given three minutes to speak. Staff and city council will make every effort to respond to questions raised during the citizen input before the meeting ends or as quickly as possible thereafter. I uh, ask that you keep your comments to three minutes, which I did say that already. If you would like to speak virtually or in person, please email or call the city recorder. Um, and um, you can get put on the list. That would be um, Melissa Bissett. That's Bissett, B-I-S-S-E-T-M at canbyoregon.gov, or you may call at 503-266-0733. We'll get you on the agenda to um, tap in virtually or, um, uh, or on the phone. Um, right now, first um, for citizen input is uh, David Tate and Linda Tate want to um, speak in support of resolution number 1356, which is um, later here in the agenda. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Tate. Good evening. Um, <laughs> sorry, we're corralling the dogs. Um, we're here tonight to speak in favor of um, a resolution for truthful and communication uh, from the council and the mayor, which we understand is going to be discussed later this evening. Um, Albert Einstein said that whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted with important matters. The mayor and three members of the city council were careless with the truth in their writing and supporting of resolution 1347. Some may argue that that's just not a big deal. It was an important symbol of support for local businesses. It was important to take action quickly, although I don't know what action was taken and I don't know why it needed to be done quickly. Um, some may say that the details were not as important as the big, big symbolism. And some may finally say, well, you just shouldn't expect politicians to tell the truth. But in the end, we're still left with a mayor and three city council members that were careless with the truth. In my opinion, this now means you cannot and should not be trusted with important matters. I hope later tonight we see unanimous support for a resolution for truthful communications from the council and mayor, because your actions related to resolution 1347 showed that for some of you, you clearly do not understand the importance of communicating truthfully to the citizens of Camby. And I'll let my wife have the chair. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, so I just I have very few things to say. Um, one is I felt um, the betrayal of what you did pretty strongly, actually. Um, I saw people on social media say things like, go mayor, get them, you know, stick it to the man. Yay, finally somebody's sticking up for us. And you know, all these things. And I kept thinking this, this is so wrong. This is so, so wrong. Like half the stuff in this isn't true, but they thought it was because you said it was, and they trusted you. Um, you know, my dad used to say, if you don't have your word, you have absolutely nothing. Um, and I want to see tonight, I'm all about the solution. I feel like you have to hold yourselves accountable. You have to. In order to, to regain the trust that was lost, you have to hold yourselves. You have to stand up and have integrity and say, I'm so sorry. You're right. Stuff that was in there wasn't true. 
And from now on, we're going to be, we're going to know better and we're going to do better. We're going to be better. Because if you can't do that, if you can't hold yourselves accountable, then how can anybody trust you in the future? So um, I feel like, like in my world, in the real world, somebody should have to, to pay consequences for this. Like, you know, res resignations or demotions or something, you know, but um, I guess I realize that we're not really kind of living in the real world when it comes to politics or, or really you guys aren't supposed to be political. You're supposed to be bipartisan, um, which makes it all the more egregious. Um, can you guys like learn to play together in the sandbox, please? Stop it. Just stop it. it, it it's, it's a bad look. It really is. Um, so I'm just going to really, I'm going to mirror what David said, and I really would like to see you all cooperate and, and say, we're going to work together. We're sorry for what happened. It's not going to happen again. And we support this resolution to tell the truth moving forward. I think it's really important that you do this. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next is, uh, I believe, Jason Patton. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Good evening, council and city staff and mayor. Thank you for having me on tonight. Um, as you probably can imagine, I attended your work session uh, because one of the items on there was near and dear to my heart, and that is streets. And I have to say, and I'm going to gloat a little bit about this, I feel very vindicated after seeing those numbers that were presented to you tonight. And affirms to me what I have been pushing for many years, that by not increasing this fee, you are uh, choking the city's ability to maintain its streets for the future. Um, one of the things that was talked about towards the end was whether this is a fee or a tax. Um, I can tell you, uh, that the reason it was made a fee was because the committee at the time and the leaders of the city at the time were almost positive that if this had went to the vote, that the citizens of this community would not vote for it. They have no problem voting for police and fire and schools for the most part, but roads are something that they use every day and for some reason do not understand that they cost money. There was an effort that was put forward by a group of people, primarily led by the gas stations in the city at the time, to bring this to a vote because that is how the process works and it failed. So that is why we have this fee today. If you, my caution to the council is that if you raise the fee too quickly, you will trigger citizens wanting to bring this to a vote. And my fear is that in doing so, it will fail, and then the city will be left with broken, brittle streets, and then 10 years down the road, when it will cost millions of dollars to fix, there will be no money to do so. And I will also go so far as to say that if there, and I know there are counselors that are very hot to trot to bring this up to a vote. I will say this, if you choose to bring this to a vote, and it fails, and the city streets degrade, it will be on your shoulders that you took a program that was doing exactly what it was intended to, the money that was being generated by it was truthfully and equitably being spent on exactly what it was supposed to be spent for, and when the roads deteriorate and people's, trend, people's cars get destroyed and so on and so forth, it will rest on your shoulders that that is going on. Uh, I beg and plead that you please work to make this fee work so that my when I'm your age or when I'm 60 or 70 or your grandchildren are driving around the city of Canby, that they don't have to go to the tire place constantly to get wheel alignments and new tires. So... Um, and I will continue to push this until something is actually done. Oh, and that's three minutes. I'm done. Great. 
Thank you, Jason. I appreciate you coming this evening um, and being uh, voicing your, your thoughts on the matter regarding the road maintenance fee. I know that you were very involved in that and, and still are very close to it to uh, uh, make sure that the council, future council stay, stay on it. So thank you. Um, Melissa, I don't think there's anyone else right now for uh, public comment. Um, is that correct? That's correct. We do not have anyone else. All right, great. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda this evening is an update regarding um, downtown parking. And I believe Jamie Stickle is here to present on that. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. And uh, Jamie is making her way up here. She's gonna give you uh, just a brief update. This is informational um, uh, for, for you and also for our, uh, our viewing audience that may uh, be interested in this. Um, we, um, as you know, we have a, an ever evolving um, and hopefully continually getting uh, busier and, and robust downtown. And with that, we have um, the opportunity to, to continue to refresh and update our, our downtown parking situation. And um, this is not anything, uh, you know, a major change of any type, but we're just refreshing some signage and uh, doing some uh, proactive uh, work and outreach. And Jamie has, um, been very helpful in coordinating and helping to spearhead that effort. So I thought it'd be nice that she'd just give you a quick update on what we're what we're doing uh, and what's coming up uh, in the near future. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, over the last few years, downtown Canby has seen tremendous growth. Um, it's also seen increased business, increased development, um, increased activity, which is something that we really want to see. Um, and with those positive increases also has come some, um, it has highlighted some of the parking constraints that some of our businesses feel. So most of the parking in the downtown core is two hour parking on street. Um, and sometimes we have people who come downtown and they want to stay a little longer. And so they might be in a two hour parking stall for longer than um, anticipated. So we had heard from some, um, some of our business owners who were asking us what the city can do to assist them in helping to remind people that on-street parking is two hours. Um, and we had a really robust conversation as far as city staff. So Scott led the conversation. Um, our planning department was there, code enforcement, obviously, public works. And, you know, it's one of many robust conversations I've had about parking in my in my nearly nine years of being with the city. And what we hear from our business owners and the community is we want to see changes in some of these, um, some of the habits that people have built without moving to daily enforcement, um, which is, is great because we do want to encourage people to continue to come downtown and to enjoy coming downtown. So we decided that we would uh, work on, first off, some updated signage in the downtown core um, this is being kicked off on Northwest 2nd Avenue between Ivy and Holly. It's a two-hour parking sign that says Monday through Saturday, 8 to 6. And um, we, we installed, well, by we, Public Works installed six of those parking signs on that block. And what we did is removed the parking signage that was there. Um, many of the signs that we have downtown, it's inconsistent, therefore it makes it confusing. So the goal is to really create cohesive and consistent signage throughout the downtown core. Um, it will, as I said, Monday through Saturday, eight to six. And I, I emphasize that again so that viewers at home can, can start to put some good behavior into play. Um, we also decided that um, an emphasis on outreach would be a very important, important thing. So um, Carrie Innes, who is our code enforcement officer, she and I went out to uh, one of the businesses and talked to them about some of their concerns. And we were able to follow up with them and with another business. And while we were doing that, Public Works, as, as if we planned it, and I, I wish I would have been so thoughtful, um, was there to to hang the new signage. So it really was, they, they weren't just hearing that we were going to do it, but they were seeing that the new signage was coming. We also, earlier today, I uh, sent out a press release to you that will go out to 
the Canby Herald and the Canby Current on our social media. And when I say our social media, I mean uh, the city of Canby, Canby Business and Canby Police. And this helps to announce some of those changes. Uh, I truly believe that, that the people of Canby and the people that visit downtown want to do the right thing. And so having cohesive signage and knowing exactly what is expected of them will help them do the right thing. And one of those things also highlights where you can park if you need to be downtown longer term, whether that is because you're going to go to a hair appointment and grab lunch and then go shopping, or if you have, are, are a downtown resident and you don't need to move your car necessarily a couple times during the day. And so we have highlighted some of that longer term parking, which is on the parking public parking lots on Northwest First Avenue near the railroad tracks. And then also the what we call the cinema parking lot, which is Northeast Second Avenue. Um, and, and a reminder that that for the city code, no, no cars can stay on the street for more than 72 hours, but we're hoping to at least move people to longer term parking if that's if that's what their intention is. And then additionally, we will be working with uh, Calvin, our economic development and tourism coordinator is going to be working on a document that he's going to be taking to downtown businesses and engaging them on where their customers can park, where employees can park, um, just in an effort to get the word out to, to hopefully reinforce some good behavior, um, as well as additional signage past that one block, but that's just where we started. And then finally, you know, if, if, a, if a business should have an issue, they could call the uh, non-emergency police line, um, and that's at 503-655-8211. With that, I would open it for any questions or comments. Great, Jamie. Thank you very much for bringing this up as an update. Um, yeah, we parking spot turnover is much like in the restaurant business is key to much like table table turnover. Um, and so I think the continuity of messaging and reemphasizing um, education versus being punitive, I think is is helpful. So thank you for that. Um, Councilor Spoon, you have a comment or question? Thank you, Mayor. So um, Jamie, this is, we've been talking about parking for decades no not really that long but it seems it seems like over the last four or five years it's become a progressively more urgent conversation as downtown grows and and people more people come and people that are coming stay for longer um one of my concerns is that i you know i don't want it to be left up to the businesses to be the ones to have to enforce parking you know there are, a lot of our businesses run very lean staff wise and it's a in my perspective, not the most reasonable request to have them be the ones to call in and, and determine if someone's been parked too long. I'm just concerned about the implications of that if that's a long-term solution for us. So I'm wondering um, if, if in the future, if we don't see resolution from this, if we continue to have this issue, can we revisit better enforcement um, of, of downtown? I mean, I like this, this step to see if, if education helps, but I feel like we did that about two years ago too, and it seems to not be solving the problem. So is there a possibility that in, we can revisit this in three to six months if there's not improvement and maybe talk about staffing um, code enforcement more, having some better enforcement? Certainly, I think that that's definitely a conversation um, that we can have, something that we can schedule if we don't see any changes. I think, um, and, and you're right that we have had the conversation before I, one of the things that we talked about um, at that time was that it would be possible to put in new signage, but we didn't actually go forward and do that. And I do think, you know, what we have some of the signs and, and best intentions, certainly, where it literally says two hour and it's kind of both ways and that's great. And then maybe not too much further down the block, it says 20 minute, two hour. And, and so we're kind of giving maybe there was three or four different signs downtown. And so having the, the new signage, I, I do think will help, but yes, we can certainly revisit. And, okay. um, you know, with having Carrie part of the conversation and, and she always has been part of this conversation. It's, it's funny to me because she, the way that she talks, she always says, Oh, I'm just one person. I'm just one person. And so you would think that that would mean that she can't or won't give the time. And I find that to be the exact opposite. She's always happy to take a meeting and she's always, she was more than happy to jump at the opportunity to go speak to a business owner. And, um, and she, 
she does great um, outreach in the sense that she talks a little bit about what she does as far as parking goes down, downtown. So it's not just um, it's not just that we are asking people to call in. It's you know if, if someone was parking in front of your business consistently all day every day, or you knew that they weren't moving their car, then you could call in. Carrie is aware that there are some constraints downtown. Um, there are also sections of downtown um, at two hour, with two-hour parking that don't have any constraints. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it might also free up if there's there's slower places we can move them to longer-term parking or um, highlight what's what's used. But Carrie does drive through downtown, pays attention. Um, she's working with um, with the Dahlia right now on some of their residents and outreach there, um, as well as uh, we're providing some some. It will be different uh, marketing materials to them that will be targeted to the residents just to help remind them that parking in a two-hour spot, um, while that won't probably get you a ticket, it, it will be parking typically in front of a business, and that can be really harmful to the business climate overall. So, um, so yes, I should have said that she, she is you know, patrolling and paying attention and, and trying also to do outreach first before enforcement, but um, I, I do think that if this does not clear up in a way that we find to be um, to the level we'd like, we could we could definitely re, re okay. approach that. Yeah, thanks. Because I've been talking to a lot of business owners downtown that you know they're um, particularly ones that have retail, restaurant, that type of where the the customer being able to get in and out quickly is maybe a little bit different than some of our service businesses, and and there is a, a legitimate concern about how it impacts you know, customers getting to their business and whether or not people stop or decide not to stop. And so if we can just revisit this in a few months, that would be great. I'd love to go back and talk to some of the businesses and see if there was improvement. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And um, and like I said, Calvin will be going um, business to business in the downtown commercial district. And, um, you know, it just gives an opportunity to talk about parking, to talk, to remind them where longer term parking is for their customers or for their employees, but also just, it's good to get out in front of our businesses and, um, especially coming out of COVID and, and coming back to the office, I think that that will be a really good thing. Uh, you know, to the point of following up and whatnot, I, yes, I think follow-up is key. I think we're going to have a distinct difference in terms of traffic and parking downtown um, here over the summer versus uh, moving into fall and winter. So, um, I, I think a check back is good. Um, I don't know if necessarily we need to course correct anything um, unless it's obviously very glaring within that six months. But I, I anticipate much like, as you said, Councilor Spoon, we've been talking about this, that um, things have, things ebb and flow. Um, and, you know, we had some significant change and then not a lot. And now we've got a bigger building downtown and there's more activity. So we've seen a shift. And so I think just got to be cautious that we're not, um, bouncing around like ping pong ball with with parking and whatnot, but just you know set set limits, set um, a course, stay with it, and then check and adjust. Um, you know, as you know, further down the road. Um, okay. Oh, I, one other thing I wanted to note that I um, I forgot when I was responding to uh, Councilor Spoon is just that you know yes, we did address this two years ago, and so it it might feel. Um, like we're just kind of saying the same thing again, but some of our businesses have changed. Some of those business owners have changed. Um, we've had obviously new development. And so I think that this is an opportunity to get everybody on board with the same messaging, um, whether they've had a long, long-standing business or a, you know, multi-generational business in town, or if they're, you know, new to, new to Canby as well. So I think that there is, opportunity, which is interesting to, when you're talking about parking, to talk about opportunity, but I always look on the bright side and I think this is a great opportunity for some course correct and some some good outreach as well. Councilor Park, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, a comment, Brian, and I think you remember this. When we hit it 10 years ago, we were doing a uh, uh, an outreach uh, where we were saying, uh, please don't park in front of businesses. Uh, it was, and it was, it was pretty effective. I mean, the message got out, uh, but it ran smack dab into human behavior. 
Um, I was uh, at one business downtown 10 years ago after this public public relations campaign and another business closed across the street and four of the employees each walked in f- it to their cars that were parked in front of this other business that was open until 11. So apparently they got the message to not park in front of their own store, but they parked in front of somebody else. In the last three months, I've seen two service people, one insurance, one attorney, walk out of their building and get into their car right in front of theirs. So um, how you handle it, Scott, you run the city, you figure it out. But we, we want this to be fixed. The only part of it that we have to do with is policy. And that is, our my policy is, I want businesses to stop complaining about people parking in front of them all day. That's my policy. The other policy, and it's no, it's, and yes, uh, Carrie was very nice showing up the other day, great attitude, helping us out and that sort of thing. But the city council itself, the budget committee, cut back her job to have time. And, and so, you know, there may be a role for us is to provide some additional resources and code enforcement. You know, we're a population of 18,000 on our way to 20,000. We're becoming a bigger city. Part of us doing our jobs in providing livability to the city is having a court court enforcement system that is robust enough uh, that continues to preserve this small town feel that we want. So, Jamie and Scott, I don't care how you do it, but if... Speaking to our better angels doesn't work, um, and we still find people parking in front of their own business, or even more ironic, park parking right in front of right in front of backstop, thinking that's going to be a better business choice than parking in front of their own. So uh, you've got my support for this uh, soft approach, um, but all of us are very good at hearing things from our businesses. And um, if if this doesn't work, we may need to move up to another level. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments for uh, Jamie about parking, the uptown, or downtown update? All right. Jamie, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you all. Next on the agenda is uh, a public hearing, a uh, public hearing regarding an appeal, um, uh, appeal uh, application 21-01 from Edward uh, Radulescu, representing Petronella Donovan of Waterstone Investments and appealing the Planning Commission's denial of a memory care facility at 1300 South, South Ivy Street, uh, applications DR 20-03, backslash um, CUP 20-02. Before I get into um, the public hearing um, formats and whatnot, um, it is my understanding that in the in the preparation of this and bringing this forward that we do have new information that is going to be presented this evening. Is that correct? Different than what new new to us but was not presented to the Planning Commission. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, ma'am. Okay, so the question then for council is, since there is new information, um, we we do have under this format the ability as the hearing body for this, this appeal to hear the new information and include that in our um, deliberations and conversations and thus a decision. Um, that's part of what we do. Or if we feel that the it's new information and we don't want to have that conversation tonight and um, would rather see that go back to the planning commission for them to hear that information uh, and maybe make a different outcome, um, that is an option as well. Um, I wanted to present that first before we go through um, the whole hearing format and presentations. Um, Councilor Parker, your hand is up, yes sir. You're muted, sir. Muted, Greg. 
We we ran into this uh, uh, once before, and and I think I think the council agreed upon this idea, which is um, we do not want to be to use judicial terms. We do not want to be a court of of de novo review of having new information brought to us. My vision for what we serve as an appellant uh, of, of a court of appeals is is one that takes a look at at process and rules and whether those things were followed. The granularity of parking rules and and whether uh, senior citizens uh, don't drive so they don't need parking spots, that is nothing that I want the council to be involved in. I we, We've got a lot on our plate, a lot of moving parts. We are not experts in the development code. And I think the fastest way to, to resolve this issue is to remand this back to the planning commission uh, in order for them to consider the new information uh, and and have them make a decision. Mayor, uh, in, in, so that we don't uh, violate procedures, would you accept a, a motion so that we can debate the motion? I'll accept the motion so we can debate it, yes. I would move that we remand this back to the Planning Commission for them to consider the new information. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made by Councillor Parker to, to uh, remand the, uh, the appeal back to the Planning Commission to hear the new information and therefore um, decide, on, make a either similar or new decision based on the new information. That has been seconded by Council President Hensley. Um, any discussion? Uh, Councillor Spoon, your hand was up first. Um, I, I support the the idea or the principle that we're an appellate um, body and not um, the original hearing body. We're not as as knowledgeable probably or as experienced in, in discussing our code as planning commission is and, and the granularity of it, like Greg said, I'm concerned that if we move forward um, with this now, it might impact our ability to hear uh, an appeal of what planning commission would decide to do. So I, I would, I would, I, you know, I list my favorite thing to talk about is land use. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about land use all day, but, um, but I do see the value in, in giving the in new information back to planning commission and letting them make the decision. And if it comes back to us after that, then you can hear that. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Bangs, you had your hand up. Yeah, I also support this motion, um, and I'm glad to hear that Councillor Parker made it. Um, it there are um, almost 400 pages of, of material in our council packet on this alone, um, and um, it, it is way too much for me to be able to make any kind of wise decision on it tonight. I, I feel terrible. We've got our applicant and all the experts all dressed up and ready to go here, but um, I don't feel qualified um, given just the short amount of time, we've had digest um, 400 pages of text and then to try and make some kind of wise decision. I'd much rather have the planning committee experts take care of this. Okay. Um, Councilor Varwick. Yeah, I do support remanding it back to the planning commission. I think that with uh, new information that they haven't heard, it would be um, unwise for us to make the decision uh, to overturn their decision um, based on information they didn't know. So I think, I think that we deserve, or they deserve the opportunity to rehear it with the new uh, information and make sure that they, they make the decision. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Tibbles. I will just add that I'm in support for all the reasons that everyone else said so that we kind of have a clear understanding of where we all lie. I think that leaning on the experts who are really into the uh, granularity of this project makes, makes the most sense, especially because we would be making a judgment on information that they didn't even get. So that doesn't make any sense to me either. So I, I'm in support. I think we're ready to vote. Okay, so motion is to remain it back to the Planning Commission. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? All right. The, the motion to remand this back to the Planning Commission for them to hear the new information and make a, a decision on uh, passes 6-0.
Um, thank you, staff, and um, to the applicants. Um, thank you um, for coming down, and, and hopefully we'll um, get this corrected and on track. So thank you. Um, next on the agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor, I first need to uh, advise that there's a change to the consent agenda as we will not be reappointing Tom Rushton to the Traffic Safety Commission. So that is an open seat coming up. He has um, tendered his resignation today. So with that, I move to approve the consent agenda that includes the minutes of the May 5th, 2021 City Council regular meeting, reappointments to the Bike and Pedestrian Committee, Clifford Ash, Michael Remelstrand, and Bruce Parker, reappointments to the Budget Committee, Andrea McCracken and Bob Patterson, reappointments to the Heritage and Landmark Commission, Karina Can Cannon and Rachel Swanson, reappointments to the Park and Rec Advisory Board, David Biscar, Jean Davis, T uh, Terry Jones, and Barbara Camel, and reappointments to the Traffic Safety Commission, Deanna ball Carb and Clint Coleman, all for three-year terms that will expire on 6-30-2024. I will second. Okay, motion has been made by Council President Hensley and seconded by Councilor Varway to approve the consent agenda, um, which include the minutes of the May 5th, 2021 City Council regular meeting, reappointments to the Bike and Pedestrian Committee, uh, Clifford Ash, Michael Hemmelstrand, and Bruce Parker, uh, reappointments to the Budget Committee, Andrea McCracken and Bob Patterson, reappointments to the Heritage and Landmark Commission, Karina Kanan and Rachel Swanson, and reappointments to the Park and Recreation Advisory Board, uh, David Biscar, Jim Davis, Terry Jones, and Barbara Carmel. And then finally, reappointments to the Traffic Safety Commission, Deanna Ball Carb, and Clint Coleman all for three-year terms that will expire on 6-30-2024. Um, all those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Anyone opposed? That carries 6-0. Next on the agenda this evening, uh, we're gonna move into resolutions and ordinances. Uh, the first First resolution um, this evening is resolution number 1349, a resolution requesting Clackamas County to surrender jurisdiction of North Locust Street, North Maple Street, and South Redwood in the Canby city limits. And Scott, I will let you expand on that. Thank you, Mayor Hodson. Um, yes, this is a follow-on uh, action to uh, your prior actions that you've taken to um, uh, move the process forward of the county road transfers uh, to the city. The, the previous actions that you um, approved enacted uh, our agreement with Clackamas County that set in motion the transfer of the funds from the county to the city, which is a big part of this. Um, receiving the roads is also receiving some of the funds to bring those up to city standards. Um, this resolution before you this evening uh, is, is another action that's required as part of this process with the county. And this, this essentially initiates the, um, the actual transfer of the roads uh, to the city. So the, the prior actions were more about the, um, the funding uh, being paid to the city, and this is actually uh, moving forward on, on the roads being transferred. We've discussed this in um, uh, fairly uh, good detail previously, so I won't go through all of the roads and, and all of the details of that. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer that. And actually, Mr. Nelzine is, is uh, present as well and can help answer any questions. But really, this is just another uh, formality in that continued process of, of moving uh, to get the roads transferred to the city. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I move to approve resolution 1349, a resolution requesting Clackamas County to surrender jurisdiction of North Locust Street, North Maple Street, and South Redwood in the city limits of Canby. Thank you. Motion has been made by Council President Hensley, seconded by Councilor Tibbles to approve resolution 1349, 
uh, resolution requesting Clackamas County to surrender ju surrender jurisdiction of North Locust Street, North Maple Street, and South Redwood in the Canby City limits. Um, any discussion? Uh, I will just add that I'm glad that, again, another piece of this puzzle is being um, completed and moved forward. Um, you know, as we had our work session today, this is this is paramount um, for us and has been for, um, I think, for Councilor Parker and Councilor Hensley and I for close to 10 years uh, to get this um, moved along. So thank you, Scott uh, and staff, for um, getting us another step closer. Um, Seeing no other comments or discussion, um, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? That carries 6-0. Uh, next on the agenda is resolution 1356, a resolution for truthful communications from council and the mayor. Um, Scott, is this, uh, I'll put this for you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this was um, requested uh, this was requested by uh, members of the council and then uh, conferred with the mayor that this would be placed on the agenda. Um, so I'll uh, actually, uh, Councilor Spoon requested, made the original request. So I'll defer to you, Councilor Spoon, to speak to the resolution. There is no um, staff report. This is a late addition. Um, so I'll, I'll have to defer to Councilor Spoon, if that's all right, on the, uh, on the resolution. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I apologize; it wasn't intended to be a late edition. It was um, it was submitted well over a, you know over a week ago. It was put on the agenda late, but it was not submitted so late. Um, it was intended to be given with plenty of time for people to read and and come and speak on it. Um, this is not intended to be any sort of scolding or or punitive. I don't think there's any other action necessary. Um, like that was spoke as was spoken to by some of our citizens, it's really just intended to set the tone because while we have a code of conduct and we have values um, that say that we ought to be honest, there's really no standard for what that looks like when it comes to the materials we vote on and uh, what we present to the community as a statement on their behalf, which is what the um, resolution to meetings ago was. And so it's really just intended to say, if we're going to um, pass some sort of legislation, policy, or resolution that is a statement on behalf of the city of Canby or be on behalf of citizens, and we say that something, that there's some documentation, or we present things as facts, that that, in, in all efforts of honesty and transparency, that information ought to be available to the citizens. Um, that information really ought to be presented at the time the resolution's presented. Um, and so, you know, after the meeting a few weeks ago, I encountered a lot of people that had lost public trust. And, and I agreed to the extent that if we're going to say that something is a fact, that, that something is well documented, that that ought to be available to the citizens. And I know um, one of the citizens that spoke earlier actually had to do a Freedom of Information Act request to try and get some of the information spoken about in uh, in the resolution a month ago and was ultimately told that there was no public record on it. Um, I had also been asking for the information since the day after the meeting and just received a portion of it um, this morning. So it's just an effort to ensure that we retain that public trust and we don't state things as facts that are not facts. And if we're saying they're facts and something's documented that we have that information to provide. And it's obviously non-binding. I think it's something that we can all agree is important as we try and like hold public trust not intended to be punitive or anything else, just really um, an agreement that that this is how we will conduct, um, you know, passing policies and making statements on behalf of citizens. So that's that's kind of where it comes from. Um, I have some some additional statistics if, if people have concerns about what was true and what isn't true, but I mean, O'Brien sent some out earlier. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of where it came from. And it's just kind of an agreement that we should all you know, provide data for things that we say are verifiable data. Okay, thank you. Um, any, is there a, a motion for the resolution? Councilor Banks? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will uh, move the resolution number 1356, a resolution for truthful communications from uh, council and the mayor. And I'll second that, Mayor. 
A uh, motion has been made um, to approve resolution 1356 um, by Councilor Bangs, a resolution for truthful communications from the council and the mayor and seconded by Councilor Parker. Um, any discussion? Um, Councilor Tibbles? I just, can I uh, just point of order so we don't kind of run into the same situation we were in last time. We had questions um, that were that kind of melded into discussion last time um, that led to some interruptions and people were upset. So are, is this the appropriate time? Are we going to be doing questions and discussion at this time? Sorry, yes. If you have questions about the resolution, then by all means ask them and we can have discussion as well. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I guess my question would obviously be directed at Councillor Spoon because she um, brought forth the resolution. And, and you know, I'm new to City Council, so I know that you've been on for a long, longer time than I have. So I just wanted to know kind of your input. Do you think this is an ongoing issue or challenge that councils either now or in the past have ran into? Is this something that, or is this really in response to a, a resolution that... Um, you weren't in favor of with some of the information not being um, as verifiable as you'd like. I just want to know if this is something like that has any historical, I guess, challenge um, with it or ongoing challenge with it. Yeah, I'll give you two thoughts on that. Typically, when things come to us, uh, they have documentation. <laughs> so you see our packet, for example, uh, every time we run into a land use, it's going to be hundreds of pages long. Um, this is the first time in my time on council that I've seen a resolution that claimed to have documentation. So it was the first time in my experience that something said there was documentation associated with it where we were not provided with the documentation and the public was not uh, presented with the documentation. So I don't experience it as an ongoing issue. The reason that I'm bringing it up is not, like I said, to be punitive or to scold, but to say that that's really not the way we should operate and let's not, let's not do it again. If we're gonna say that something's documented, let's provide documentation like we do with everything else we address on council. You know, that's the reason we have packets. So it, it really, it's, there's nothing personal about it. I just, I just found that the public was a little averse to to, to feeling like they had to continually ask what that documentation is. If we're going to say that something's documented, we should provide that documentation. And so that, that's really where it comes from. It's I have not experienced it as an ongoing issue. I've only experienced that documentation is provided, which is why I, I assumed that was the standard, but found out there was really no standard for that. So it's really to kind of cut it off at the past to make sure that this doesn't happen for our citizens again. Thank you, Jordan. Any other, Councilor Hensley, you had, were you waving uh, yeah. your hand? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I believe that you um, did your best with that resolution. I also believe that you did give us the documentation, the data points that were needed in our email that you sent out. And I feel that this resolution is redundant given that it's already in the second stanza of our values and goals, um, that we are to be held to the highest standards of honesty and ethical conduct. So I feel that this is just another step in the, the misbehaviors that we are, we, you know, Mr. Mayor, can we just get back to the business of the city, please? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, screw your hands up again. Yeah, I think that providing documentation with stuff is the business of the city, especially as elected officials. The reason I don't think it's redundant, I already said, is that while values say that we have to be honest, it says nothing about transparency in terms of providing information to the citizens that we claim exists. Um, so it's not redundant because that's not that's not something that that our values address. But also our goals also say that we're going to help businesses, which would make the resolution a month ago redundant. I mean, it's like there there is a lot of redundancy in government. And so I, I don't, you know, this is not, I'm, I'm just surprised that you would respond that way to something that I think we can all agree on. It, it's really to help us all and to help our citizens get the information that they, in my opinion, are entitled to. Councilor Tibbles. 
Yeah, I guess the comments that I would have is, you know, I perceive it, and I think that I wouldn't be alone if you went, if you took it to the citizens of Canby, that uh, it's a backhanded way of calling the mayor and the council who supported it liars. Um, that's my perception. You might not mean it that way. I'm just saying that I believe that I'm probably not alone in that. And one thing that resonated with me that uh, Mrs. Tate said in the call was that she's ready for us to work together um, and so I, I don't think necessarily saying, okay, I didn't agree with this resolution. You said yourself, it's not an ongoing issue that you've experienced both in this term or last term, um, that, you know, the counter to that is another resolution that, you know, is perceived by me my, and, and probably by others as calling anyone who agreed with it a liar. Um, so I would propose, I think it makes more sense in the spirit of working together that if there were issues with that resolution, that we work on it together as a council and the issues that you had that were factually, do you think factually incorrect or whatever those would be, that we submit those and we reopen the resolution and then we take those things out so that we as a council can be united and standing for business owners. And I think that that's a true compromise um, that I would love to see other people's feedback on, on that approach. Um, Councilor Varwig. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. No, you wouldn't feel alone in that. I, I feel the same way. Um, I, I look at the words of this resolution and I think there's some wonderful words in it. Um, and, but we also have a really great council policies and guidelines and, and all of that. I, I don't see how this resolution forces us to do anything different than our council policies and guidelines does. Um, I think it's important to make it clear because I've heard the comment a couple of times that, you know, a group of councilors got together and crafted an, a resolution last time and that's false information. We, we didn't uh, get together and, and craft it. I was not in a uh, part of it forming, uh, forming any of the words of the last resolution. Um, so, so just so that's out there. That's that was is false information. That resolution was crafted by, uh, I believe, uh, the mayor and the city attorney. Um, from my understanding, I was just in favor of of having a resolution. Um, I want to uh, take some of the words of wis words of wisdom from our citizens that spoke earlier, uh, who cautioned us against taking action too quickly. Um, this resolution, I saw at 4.59 last night. Um, I know that was the complaint of the resolution two weeks ago, was that there just wasn't enough time to consider it. Um, and because there was not enough time to consider this one either, I I can't be in support of this one either. So I would be in support of reopening the last resolution, having some discussion on it. Hindsight is always 2020. I wish that, you know, thinking back, um, I think we could have handled it a little bit differently. And I think that it would have been great if we had had some more discussion on it. Um, but I don't regret my decision to vote for it. It was in support of the businesses. Um, the spirit of the resolution was what I voted on. I'm not necessarily the exact words, but I'm gonna, I'm just not gonna be in support of this one tonight just because I haven't had time to consider it. Um, I've had a busy day at work today and I read my packet last week. So getting this last evening, I just haven't had time to uh, spend a whole lot of time on it. So I'm just not in favor of it tonight. Thank you, uh, Councilor Parker, and then Councilor Spoon. Well, I had something else to say, but with Councilor Varwig's comments saying that this was presented to him too soon, it 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 echoes the complaint that if if you feel that way tonight, why didn't you feel that way two weeks ago? Um, and as as to Councilor. Uh, Tibble's comment about uh, reopening the discussion. Uh, I can't in my mind wrap around the idea that you think you stand behind what you said, but you're willing to take stuff out that was wrong. Um, and if you remember, several of us said, let's work on it right here, right now. Let's wordsmith this stuff. And and in, you know and and I did research the foreclosure information. Foreclosures are down thirty seven percent. So a resolution was passed that was factually incorrect. Now, 
to Council President Hensley's point, that we already have language that prevents us from doing what we did. Well, think about those words. If we have language against what we did, apparently it wasn't clear enough to keep us from doing what we did. It's a simple request that this sort of thing doesn't happen again, that we go through staff, and that anything that is presented as fact is vetted by city staff. That's all. Um, Councilor Spoon and Councilor Hensley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I mean, it's at when we, a month ago when we were discussing the previous resolution, I know Councilor Banks multiple times said, maybe we can take this out because it's not true. And I, at the end, offered a compromise that we all work together to write a factual resolution from us that represents the city of Canby and no one wanted to do it then. <laughs> it's incredibly frustrating to suddenly hear that what we need to do is work together because that's what we were trying to do. And when that was denied to us, the opportunity to work together, I just wanna make sure like, like Councillor Parker said, if, we, if this is already addressed in our code of conduct and our values, then it shouldn't have happened. But it did happen, so now I feel like it should be addressed so that it doesn't happen again. It's not, it's like there's no ulterior motive. I literally just want, if if people say something is documented and factually true, we should be able to demonstrate that with the documentation that was alluded to. And it's frustrating to hear that suddenly everyone wants to work together on something that we begged you to work together on a month ago. And, and again, it being a late addition to the agenda was not because it was submitted late. It's because it was added to the agenda late. It was submitted over a week ago. So there's there's nothing in here that needs to be fact checked, which is for me the difference between a month ago and, and now that I felt like we needed time to fact check things. In regards to whether or not the documentation was provided to us, Council President Hensley, some of it was today, not all of it was, but what that documentation demonstrated is that what burglaries are up 12, thefts are exactly the same and domestic violence down is down and thefts are actually on trend to be down again this year. It didn't demonstrate a significant increase, a well-documented significant in increase in crimes of desperation. They don't, they don't account for bankruptcies by, um, by zip code, but I went to the US bankruptcy court's data and bankruptcies are actually down both in business and in personal 44.6% in Clackamas County from 19 to 20 and 20 to 21. So I just don't, I mean, to say that that document, documentation was later to provided to us is just not accurate, which is exactly the problem I have that we should be dealing with facts if we're gonna say something is a fact. If we're gonna say that something's well documented, we should be dealing with those documents. And and that just wasn't done. And and the idea that it, that that our current values prevent us from doing it was proven wrong because it wasn't done. So to me, it's just an agreement moving forward. There's no ulterior motive. Let's just make an agreement as a council. I'm not trying to relitigate anything. Let's make an agreement as a council that moving forward, if we're gonna say something's well-documented and true, that we provide that documentation to each other like we do for every other thing in the packet and on the agenda. Councilor Hensley and then Councilor Vangs. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh. I'm frustrated as well um, because I've had conversations with multiple counselors since that meeting and Councilor Parker, I'm a little disappointed because you were in favor of cracking open that resolution and re reworking it. And now you're telling me you're not. So I'm disappointed in that. Um, I actually started working on a revised version of the resolution and until all this started, I, I did submit it to the mayor as a seed for everybody to see. Um, I would be in favor. Thank you, Councillor Tibbles, for bringing that up. I, I would be in favor of reworking that. Um, I just really want this tit for tat attacks on each other to stop and it needs to stop now. Councillor Baines. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I, I appreciate a number of your comments here tonight, um, uh, including um, Councillor Tibble's request, uh, or perhaps it was Varwig. This has gone on a while and I have a hard time tracking it. Request that, uh, that you have enough time to read it. I think that's essential. Um, I think that was a, uh, a major flaw with the resolution. 
uh, that we looked at before. Um, I do maintain that there were multiple parts that were not true in that last resolution, but uh, I prefer to move on. Like, I, I don't really need to open up that old wounds. Our businesses are open now. So to, to have another fight over that same resolution <clears throat> doesn't seem to advance the city's interest at this point um, because the governor did what she said she would do and lifted all the restrictions uh, two days after we passed that resolution. Um, I, I do believe there's some inconsistencies in the message, but I want to move forward. And if it takes you two more weeks to decide whether or not we should be honest and truthful in our resolutions, um, I'm in, I have no problem with that. I think that's fine. And um, so if that's the will of the council, I'll go along with that. I don't know what the procedure is if you want to table it, but I would like to see it up on the agenda in two weeks if we do. There is a motion on the table. Um, could we, uh, I mean, if there's a motion to pass. Can we amend that motion or table it in the middle of that motion? Mr. Mayor, call for the question. Okay. So the question is, or the motion has been made to approve the ordinance um, 1356, um, and it was made by Councillor Bangs and seconded by Councillor Parker. Um, question has been called. Um, all those in favor I think of- that's how parliamentary procedure calls. Doesn't there have to be a plurality of council if the question's called? You have, have to have, have a question. You have to have a vote to end debate, yes. Yeah, so, so I don't, I'm just okay. clarifying Sorry. that. Yeah, you Thank can't you, call for the question and then. Okay, so the question's been called. Is there, to, is there a second to end debate? No. no. Farwick so, said yes. So there's a there's a second to end debate and, and move for the vote. Um, all those in favor of ending discussion? Um, all those um, opposed to ending discussion? Uh, I I'm always have been one to allow conversation to occur and for um, councilors to um, say their piece. So I, I will vote that we um, not end the debate. And um, I've got Councilor, Councilor Bangs, is there anything else you wanted to add? Your hand was still up. Uh, no, only that I'm willing to go along with a uh, two week table if that's what the, the will of the council is, but I don't know what the procedure would be to add that in the middle of the motion. It would be, it would have to be a matter of um, um, my understanding, and that's Joe, I see you there in the background, is that would have to be res rescinding the motion and then amending it, or is that correct, Joe? You all you are muted there at City Hall. You don't have to rescind it, you can amend it, but the person who made the second has to second the amendment. If, if you move to table it, um, you could table it to a date certain if you want. It would take a first and a second and a majority vote. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm going to echo uh, Councilor Bangs. Like, you know, we have a motion here on the table. We have a resolution here. You know, decide um, and and move on. Um, but that's that's not my call. That's just my opinion. Um, so that's out there. Um, Councilor Spoon. Yeah. If I know Councilor Varwig said that he would vote, he was intending to vote against it because he hadn't had time. I, I, I mean, I assume we can just set the standard that we provide documentation and move on. But if Councilor Varwig feels better having more time to read it, I will certainly support that. Um, I think that we can probably just I mean, if that's if that's the barrier between where he is and and feeling like he can vote on it well informed, which is what he seemed to say, then then I would support that. We can also just vote tonight. But I will say, like, one of one of my concerns is that you know, there's been a lot of projection of intent here, and and that's that's actually something that our council code of conduct says that we shouldn't do is is, pro, is assume intent or project intent or whatnot. And and there is no ill will or malintent in here. I spent weeks trying to get information. I didn't get it. And I just thought, why don't we just all agree that moving forward, we can, we can handle things differently. There's no, it's actually oddly enough, an attempt to get us all on the same page moving forward. And the fact that you guys perceived it as ill-intended is, 
is not only a violation of our code of conduct, but it's just not true. Any one of you could have called me. You could have asked me what my intent was. Um, calling it a tit for tat or whatnot is the exact opposite of what it is. It's really saying, let's all agree that this is the way that we're going to con conduct um, conduct resolutions, ordinances, and and claims that should be verifiable. And and I'm, it's unfortunate that you guys have projected intent on that, but oddly enough, it, it's actually an effort to get us on the same page moving forward. So we don't have a repeat of a month ago. So we don't have frustrated people saying, where's this information? What's that? That that can devolve into, into a less than pleasant conversation. Um, weirdly, I did not think that so many people would object to having a standard that we provide documentation when we say it's available. It's actually kind of concerning to me, to be honest, but but you're all at where you're at and I'm at where I'm at. So yeah, let's. Councilor Parker and then Councilor Tibbles. Yeah, I think we're headed for another 3-3 three, three vote and you get to decide what this one is well, Mayor, but uh, since uh, uh, Councilor Hensley brought up my name, let me confirm that I did say what she said I said is that I was prepared to go in and rework this resolution. And I said, when will we see it? And you said, in two weeks. So I don't have a chance to rework it tonight. I'm still willing to rework it. And here's the ironic thing. The fact that we have several counselors saying, we're willing to go in and take out untrue things that we voted for, shows that we actually do need a resolution saying, we're not going to do this again. I mean, if, if, you, if you are comfortable with the vote that you took last time and the, you think everything is truthful, then why isn't your position, I don't want to touch it? You know, by the very fact that you we have people who are willing to go in and rework this resolution is an admission that, that half of the council did vote for something that had information that was not documented. When the mayor did send us a few things today, he said... He got this after the resolution was written. So the information was not developed beforehand. We're asking that next time we're faced with this situation, we have the information vetted and prepared in advance. Councilor Tibbles and then Councilor Hensley. I just want to first comment on Councilor Parker's regards. I don't think anyone here has said that, um, or at least I didn't, I'll speak for myself. I said that in the spirit of working together, and I recognized that the language was not well received by half of the council, and I am sick of having these, these split council blow-ups like we did, that I would be willing to sit down and work like I believe we could have done in the first place, and I think could, things could have been done better to have you part of that process. That doesn't mean that I'm saying, walking away and saying, oh, I, it's an admission that I actually don't believe what it says. It means if there's language that you're uncomfortable with, I think that I owe it to the citizens and to myself to hear you out on that. And I'm willing to do it because that's what I wanna do going forward. That is not, I just don't want those words to be misconstrued as me saying, oh, well, I don't stand behind my vote and I don't stand behind what it said. I'm willing to sit down and have coffee. I'm happy, and Councilor Spoon, I'll take you up on that. I will have coffee with you to talk about the spirit of this resolution. I think that in order for us to move forward, we need to be willing to do that. So I just needed to correct that because it was not an admission. All of a sudden, I don't stand behind my vote as Councilor Parker was alluding to, and I will take you up on that, Councilor Spoon. I think if everyone can get there, it sounds like we might even be able to get there if we just get this two weeks and table it. If that's what it's going to be for us to work together, I, like for crying out loud, let's let's do it. Um, and Jordan, like I, we ta we chatted just about, we chatted before Jordan went on vacation, and we agreed we'd have coffee. And I'm looking forward to doing it. And I think that that's how we get you know to where we're headed. <sighs> Uh, Councilor Hensley and then Councilor Varwick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I still stand behind my vote from the last meeting on the resolution. It is unfortunate the staff didn't have the time to verify data completely as, as far as it is to can be. I still believe that there is a rise in, in mental health issues, a rise in domestic violence, a rise in suicides, maybe not in can be proper, 
but these things are happening. Absolutely. I hear about it every day and I'm not going to argue about it. It's, it is fact. And I, I stand by my vote. I believe that the facts were as, as true as they could have been in the short amount of time that Joe had to get that resolution put together. And, uh, he's in the mayor has worked on it since. Uh, and getting out those data points to you. And I don't want to keep doing this every two weeks. So I, 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 I'm, I'm against this resolution because we already have those standards and values. This is an unfortunate situation that happened that you guys didn't agree with parts of the, the, the resolution. I've had conversations with you all. We've talked about reworking it. I'm for reworking it and taking out some of the language that might have uh, been objectionable to you and repassing it. And I don't know what else to say other than I really just want this to stop and get back to just let's talk about sludge and sewage again. Um, Councilor Varwig, then Councilor Banks. Yeah, shout out to all the other councils who have their popcorn popped watching us sing. I'm glad that it's not us. Um, I'm really getting frustrated with my words being twisted all the time um, and frankly feeling attacked when I have a, a, an opinion. And uh, yeah, I said I, I got this at 4.59 last night. Whether it was intended to come out a week ago, it came out at 4.59 last night. I haven't had time to, to read through it. Uh, and I want to heed the advice of our citizens who spoke earlier of who said don't act too quickly on these resolutions they said we acted too quickly last time i'm taking that advice maybe we did and so yeah i am asking um, whoever made the motion i would love if you would consider amending it to give us a couple more weeks so that we can talk about it maybe we can combine the two resolutions together and come up with something that we're all happy with whether you know we wanted to do that last time or not here we are asking for the opportunity and we're being attacked for that. So we did it last time, but here we are this time saying, you know what, maybe you were right. Let's take some time and talk through it. So I'm begging whoever made the motion, please to consider amending it to give us a couple more weeks so that we can talk about it so we can end this back and forth personal attacks against each other and move forward in a healthy way. Um, I I'm going to chime in here before you speak, Ms. Uh, Councilor Bangs, real quick. Um, uh, us reworking this in two weeks, I, I, I don't, you know, or combining the two, um, or rehashing this, I, I think the, I don't think, I'm going to trust Councilor Spoon that what she's asking for is what it is. Um, you know, I, I, I think two more weeks or four more weeks of trying to word rehash this and wordsmith it even more um, continues us not doing what we need to do as Councillor Hensley stated and what we had community input on. Um, uh, resolution 1347 from a month ago um, and here we are, we're talking about it. Okay, so um, if I was hasty in it, then okay, then I was then great lesson learned and to not be so hasty. Um, fine, you know we got to move on. Our staff does not have time um, to try to meld these two together, or um, or to put a ad hoc committee together of counselors, which will just be a, a mic, I believe, a microcosm of this conversation. Okay, so um, I, I, I don't think tabling it changes anything. I think we have a motion on the table. Um, I say we, you know, I say we take it in its purest intent. If that's truly what in, her intent is, then we do that. I think we are... Um, we we've got we've got we got stuff to do, gang. So I, that's my piece. Um, Councillor Banks. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I agree uh, with you that I do not want to relitigate or re-argue the previous resolution that's water under the bridge. Um, and I will honor Councillor Barwig's request to uh, extend this two minutes by amending my motion to put it on the agenda at our next meeting. So you're amending your motion to put this particular resolution on the next agenda for conversation. Well, approval. I'm moving to amend it. Okay. Yeah, that's my motion to table this for two weeks. Is that right? It's two weeks. This is the first meeting in June, right? Two weeks. Councilor Parker, do you accept the amended uh, motion? Um, yes, I do. Thank you. Councilor Barber, I, you're waving your hand. Yeah, you know, it. you made a really good point, Mr. Mayor, and I'm going to eat crow a little bit here and, and just say that um, if, if we are going to move forward in a healthy way, we do need to put some trust in each other. And um, having had some recent conversations with Councillor Spoon, I, I do think that she uh, probably does mean uh, the best by this resolution. So um, I appreciate you uh, entertaining that, uh, Councillor Banks, if you choose not to. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and go along with this just for, the, again, the spirit of it. Um, I just read through it again three times just to make sure that I wasn't missing anything. Um, I don't see anything glaring that I can't get past, so. Um, Councillor Tibbles and Councillor Banks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, well, I, I stand by what I said, uh, but I did, I do want to make the distinction where I say I perceived it a certain way, but I don't, I realize that that might not be your intent and other people could perceive it that way. I, I remember our conversation at backstop and uh, when we talked about how actually we might see things differently politically and it was after you came to the, uh, the governor, um, potential governor candidates um, speech and we were saying how much we actually agree. Um, so I think that in the spirit of that and in the spirit of the, you know, us having that conversation, I can take it at face value that your your intentions are well on this and I can get behind it and I'm happy to meet you there and I still will take you up on that copy. Um, Councilor Banks. Then I withdraw my amendment to table the motion for two weeks and would uh, like us to vote on the resolution 13 something as I had previously said. 1356 and Councilor Parker do you Agree with me? Yes. Okay. I still have hands up, Councillor Hensley. So, motion's been uh, made again for approval of resolution number 1356 by Councillor Banks, second by Councillor Parker, um, Councillor Hensley, Spoon, and then Varwig. I, I, I still, you know what? I can count to four and I want this to end. It's nine o'clock and we still have a lot of agenda to go. So, let's put this water under the bridge, shall we? Okay. I took my hand down, but not mute. Uh, no, I just wanted to tell Councillor um, Tibbles and Councillor Barwig how much I appreciate the the trust. I mean, I know that that the culture of our country right now doesn't make it easy to try and see eye to eye. But um, you know, I believe that we we all have good intent here, and and I appreciate you um, accepting my intent at face value. I think it really helps us work together as a, as a, as a council. And I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate that. Yeah. Council Farwig. Yeah. I just, one last thing is just to say, you know, I, I hope that we can learn something from this conversation tonight and that we all are very passionate about Canby. We all love Canby a whole lot. Um, and I think that, um, we've all, uh, misunderstood each other long enough and I hope that we can move forward on future business, uh, trying to, um, understand intent of uh, the, or the meaning behind things instead of uh, it's believing that it's uh, I'm not smart enough to know what I'm really trying to say but um, I think we all expect that each other the other side is going to come at us and I think that if we can just stop thinking that way and realize that we all love can be um, and we just might get there uh, on a different route that's okay sometimes and uh, let's let's move forward kindly uh, with each other any other discussion? Are we done with debate? Okay. 
All those in favor of passing resolution 1356. 123456. Anyone opposed? That motion carries 6 0. Next on the agenda is considering ordinance number 1556, an ordinance authorizing the city administrator to enter into a collective bargaining agreement, CBA, between the city of Canby, Oregon, and local 350 6 AFSCME Council 75 AFL CIO. Second reading, Scott, uh, you want to fill, fill us in or remind us of this one? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, um, this is, yes, again, a second reading. Uh, this is to uh, enter into a new uh, four-year agreement with our um, AFSCME um, bargaining group. Uh, it was a very um, uh, collegial and cooperative process. I want to reemphasize that again. Joe gave you the report last time, but um, really, uh, I think, an exemplary um, manner in which the um, the parties reached this agreement and in such um, a quick amount of time. So uh, we're very pleased about that. And I think it's just a reflection of, of the good working relationship in the city. So um, with that, uh, no additional information. Uh, again, just asking for your approval of second reading. Great. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt ordinance 1556, an ordinance authorizing the city administrator to enter into a collective bargaining agreement between the city of Campbell, Canby and local 350-6. Six AFSCME Council 75 AFL CIO. Thank you, sir. There's a second. Uh, Councillor Spoon, I think I saw your hand wave across the screen. Um, motion's been made by Councillor Varwig and seconded by Councillor Spoon to approve ordinance number 1556, an ordinance authorizing the city administrator to enter into a collective bargaining agreement between the city of Canby, Oregon and local 350-6 AFSCME Council 75 AFLCIO. A roll call vote. Councilor Banks. Aye. Council President Hensley. Aye. Councilor Parker. Aye. Councilor Spoon. Aye. Councilor Tibbles. Aye. Councilor Barwick. Aye. That motion carries 6-0. Uh, next on the agenda is ordinance, uh, considering ordinance number 1557, an ordinance authorizing the city administrator to purchase one transit van for Canby Area Transit from Shechke Northwest Sales of Portland, Oregon. And this is also a second reading. Scott. Mr. Mayor, no, no additional information uh, from last time. Uh, Mr. Wood, our Transit director gave you a full report on, on this purchase. So just ask for your approval. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt move ordinance to 1557, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and city administrator to purchase one vehicle for Candy Area Transit from Shetke Northwest Bus Sales of Portland, Oregon. Motion has been made by Councillor Varwig to approve ordinance number 1557. In order to, an ordinance authorizing the city administrator to purchase one transit van for Canby Area Transit from Shetsky Northwest Sales of Portland, Oregon, um, seconded by Council President Hensley. Uh, roll call vote. Councilor Banks. Aye. Council President Hensley. Aye. Councilor Parker. Aye. Councilor Spoon. Aye. Councilor Tibbles. Aye. Councilor Barway. Aye. Motion carries 6-0. Thank you. Um, new business this evening is a discussion regarding the noise ordinance exceptions. Um, I want to thank Councillor Banks for bringing this forward. Um, there was some conversation back and forth about um, right now, I think in, in the noise ordinance, um, we have exceptions for the city of Camby for the um, county slash fairgrounds and so the question was posed um to discuss looking at extending that i believe um to the high school based on um prior years beyond the football games but also to include perhaps the uh, graduation and i'm going to turn it over to you councillor bangs to elaborate or uh, correct my uh, introduction 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. No, that is correct. Is it possible I can share the screen? No, no. Actually, you know what? I can I can put it in the chat. This right here, which I've just put in the chat. Can you guys see that? Or I hit return first. There we go. Uh, this uh, is the amendment I am proposing that we pass. It is um, in our city code 9.48.050 under exceptions and variances, uh, you can see that we currently have um, uh, permission from the city to shoot fireworks off during football games, which we've done at least the 20 years I've lived here. I propose to add the phrase and graduation, which we've also been doing for years after the word, after the word games. So my proposal would be uh, to uh, sounds produced by sound amplifying equipment at activities, including fireworks and other explosive devices at football games and graduation. Um, and um, I do believe our uh, school principal is here to speak on this um, issue, but I, I can tell you that we've been doing the fireworks already at graduation for as many years as I can remember. So this um, is simply legalizing um, and creating a, a de jour recognition of what we've been doing already. Yeah, so thanks, Councilor Banks. So it, it, it's not anything that necessarily is a decision this evening, but it's more of a conversation if we want to add that language and then to have staff bring this back with the added language for us to um, approve the uh, the new language in the ordinance, therefore updating it with, with what's just proposed. Um, before um, I unleash the counselors, um, I, yes, as Councilor Banks said, uh, Principal Greg D uh, Dinza is here to, or online, uh, to uh, speak to this as well. Um, good evening, Principal Dinza. How are you? Um, very well, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Um, well, that's a loaded question, sir. <laughs> um, I will say congratulations. It sounds like you have a new boss. Yes, a moment, just moments ago, the board voted to extend an offer to uh, Aaron Downs, Dr. Aaron Downs of Westland Wilsonville School District. He'll be, I hope, joining us as our new superintendent. So that's very exciting news. And uh, there goes my school board report. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, Mr. Bangs, uh, give me an opportunity to steal the stage. I'll take care, advantage of that. Um, well, that's, that's, that's good news. Um, so, uh, Principal Dins, if you wanted to speak to the fireworks piece for, I think it's the addition of, of including graduation in into uh, our verbiage, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank Councillor Bangs for bringing this up and I think formalizing um, uh, this event that we do every year. So uh, traditionally, as Councillor Bangs said, um, we do uh, light off fireworks during our football games. And the only other regular event that we do is at graduation. That's one of the culminating uh, parts of the evening for our graduates as we finish up. So uh, it's wonderful that he uh, is taking this initiative to formalize this and just um, put this into uh, writing. Um, and we, you know, we hope that the board considers it and passes it because uh, um, this is an annual tradition for our students, and we'd like to, as I said, just make sure that's formally accepted and we can continue to move forward with this. Great. Well, thank you for um, dialing in this evening. We appreciate it. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, good luck with your new boss. Hope we can close Great. the deal. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, all right. So, Clarification or conversation pieces regarding this. Um, Councillor Spoon, your hand is up. Yeah, out of respect for an on long time ongoing conversation we're having, did anyone reach out to Paul to let him know we'd be talking about this tonight? That I am not aware of. Um, That's yes, I, I, it's kind of disappointing. I mean, he's been, there's no way you could tell from the agenda that it would be about the issue he's come to us repeatedly about. Um, so it would have been nice to engage him in this conversation. I think we owe it that to him, to be honest. Um, I, I think that um, 
you know, I, I like the fireworks myself. I don't live too far from Paul. They are loud. I enjoy them. I know that not everyone in our neighborhood in the surrounding area does. I know that it's actually a protected area for noise. And, and this isn't exactly consistent with that. And I empathize with that. I can get behind codifying this for graduation. My ask would be that, um, in party, in, in cooperation with this and to be good partners as we've given them exceptions we give to really almost no one else, um, it would be nice if the school would make the effort to inform maybe on an annual basis the neighbors um, that would normally be informed of what the dates of the home football games and the graduation are just so that they have that. Not all of them use the internet, I know, uh, in living here. So I, I think that would be a nice effort in conjunction with codifying this. And and if there's cooperation in that way, I could get behind that. Um, but I just really wish that we had engaged Paul if this was the conversation, because I think Paul's made an effort to to stay engaged on the topic. So I'm a little disappointed we didn't do that, but um, I can get behind supporting this. I just, my hope is that we can ask the school to be a partner with us and actually inform the neighbors of the dates and times of these events. I know that this year with graduation, we didn't know if we could have graduation and if so, what it would look like and when it would be. So I know this year was an extra challenge and and I'm not concerned um, as much about this year, but I think that being a good neighbor, considering we've been given petitions by groups of neighbors, we've had people come um, asking them to be a good neighbor would be, I think, a nice partnership on this. Um, Councilor Spoon, I don't disagree. I I, um, I did not necessarily press about reaching out to Paul because um, this was just a conversation about um, even us moving forward with changing the language, um, you know, if in fact that's what we want to do and have that as an agenda item for conversation uh, at the next meeting, because um, that's this is just uh, I wanted to. Uh, I thought uh, Councillor Banks's piece of bringing this forward was worthy of conversation because that is something that we as a group have talked about before regarding graduation, um, and even um, you know at one point there was conversation about not including the school and football games in at all and making them come and ask much like the wild hair did a couple of weeks ago and just ask for a slate of dates. So um, if our desire as a group is to open that ordinance up for conversation, then absolutely. I think that we would extend an invitation to Paul. Yeah, I appreciate that. I must have misunderstood what we were doing because it was under new business. I didn't know if we were voting on it. Or if we're, no. So we're just having a conversation about whether we're willing to have a conversation. This is about, this is a meeting to talk about planning another meeting. Oh, I love it. <laughs> um, then then I, I think that it's appropriate that we open it up because they've been doing fireworks at graduation, whether they were authorized to or not. So it's wor worthy of a conversation to have. Um, and it needs to be opened and discussed. But I just, I would ask that city engage Paul and invite him and give him plenty of time. Um, because I think that that would be an appropriate action on our part, given his um, continued conversation. Okay. Councilor Hensley and then Councilor Banks. Yeah, I wasn't terribly concerned that we didn't reach out to Paul this time just because I knew it was a conversation about whether or not we wanted to do anything. Um, I, I do expect that he will be at any future meeting that we talk about this if we actually get it to ordinance form. Um, I'm, I'm personally, I'm also fine with the fireworks. It's been tradition for years and years that, I mean, beyond half the neighborhood moved in there. Um, but I will agree with Councillor Spoon that I, I believe that the school district can make efforts in being a good neighbor and publishing, even if they just walk a flyer around to the neighborhood and um, with the published dates of those of those firework events so that people can plan if they don't want to hear them. Okay. Um, Councilor Bangs and then Councilor Varwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I agree uh, with both Councilors Hensley and Spoon um, that um, the, the school, well, so I have a, a little bit of uh, information here. First, um, I did request that we put this ordinance on the agenda and, it, and it, be, it evolved into a discussion item. Um, the school had looked into getting the proper variance for the no, noise uh, ordinance to shoot them off this year, but the decision to have graduation outside was made after the ability for us to pull that off in the timeline given. Um, the, um, 
I also suggested that we reach out to Paul um, for the very same reasons that you expressed. The uh, school, and I don't think that Principal Dinza is allowed to like just participate in this. So the, uh, he's already agreed that uh, we can post the dates for all the football games and graduation on the school calendar and deliver notes to the neighbors that have all those dates and specify that. I think that uh, the, the school is in perfect agreement with that too. I will also finally add that um, uh, this is really a demonstration of Western Fireworks, which is based in Canby and is the largest distributor of fireworks. They get all of the um, fire marshal permits. So they've done all the permitting for many years now uh, while they showcase their events here. Um, at, at the high school football games. Um, we are the only uh, high school that I'm aware of that does this, but we're also the only town that hosts Western Fireworks. So uh, those were all just um, extra pieces of information that I wanted to, to give you all. Thank you, sir. Councilor Varvey. Yeah, as a neighbor in the neighborhood, about a block and a half away from the high school where the fireworks are lit off, I, you know, I absolutely uh, sympathize with Paul, but I also love the fireworks. I love uh, watching them from my driveway. So this is an invitation on graduation night. Come over to my house, we'll watch fireworks. Um, but I, I absolutely want to uh, open this for discussion. I, I do think we need to include it. I uh, love the fireworks during the football games. I think that it's, um, it's really encouraging for uh, kids. My school didn't do it, and we lost all of our football games. Um, so... <laughs> Maybe there's some correlation there, so keep them going. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to have the conversation. I think that the uh, bright stadium lights are more intrusive on my house than the fireworks. So uh, can we turn those off before 10 o'clock p.m.? That would be great. Thank you, Councilor Parker. Um, Chris, uh, did you did you say that um, uh, we are going to have uh, some fireworks uh, coming up? Uh, soon before we have a chance to discuss that. I, I think that's important to get on the record and get out in the community that this isn't a theoretical thing happening next year, that it's happening this month. Yes. Um, it's happening next Friday. And um, it, it has happened every year for graduation forever. So yeah, this is not a theoretical thing and it is not an increase in what the school has already done. Um, but simply codifying it like we did with the fireworks. I guess for many years, they didn't have the codified permission for the fireworks. I think the fireworks predate the noise ordinance, but I don't know how long it's been happening. I've only lived here since um, 2000, 2001. Well, Mayor, the, my, my point is that uh, a casual observer may look at upon us as, as that we're, we're creating legislation to permit this to happen. Uh, in fact, it's going to happen next week. And so uh, I think in as many venues as we can, and uh, Principal Dinsta, thank you for joining us tonight and uh, of getting that out. Um, I understand the short time frame that it didn't allow us to go through the normal noise exception. Be that as it may, let's make the best of a, the situation that we're faced with and uh, have people understand that what we're talking about is is codifying something that is practice, uh, but that in fact, this practice is gonna continue next Friday. Okay, thank you. So just with nods of, a, of I think approval, I'll take first is to, um, yes, we're open to adding this to the agenda and adding the language of including graduation in the ordinance. And we will update that um, at our next earliest convenience. That, is that an affirmative across the board? Okay, Scott and Joe, any further input or you guys are good? Well, I guess for the purposes of, cause I'm seeing a general consensus that you wanna see this particular language come back at your next meeting. Um, our ordinance process does take two readings and then a 30 day absent an emergency. I don't really see an emergency here. Um, but this is not unlike when marijuana legislation passed in um, a few years back, and then the prosecutions of marijuana stopped before the law actually became uh, active, and it was because the judicial process takes months, and so if you go ticket somebody for an activity knowing that the law is going to change, oftentimes 
it will become moot before it gets in front of a judge. Um, so what I will do is uh, act accordingly and not prosecute this as a violation, knowing that you are more most likely going to codify this activity and therefore it will become moot before justice, the wheels of justice will grind on top of it. So that's my understanding from your consensus. That is a correct understanding. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Okay. Councilor Spoon? Yeah, is is um, Principal Dinsay still here? I don't think no? so. Okay, Chris, uh, yeah. would you mind? Oh, Scott or Chris, one of you, uh, would you reach out to him and ask him to at least alert Paul that the fireworks are going to happen next Friday? I, I'm okay. Obviously, I'm not interested in like ticking him or finding the school, but it would be really outstanding if they would reach out to him in in you know this week so that he has plenty of time to prepare. And Principal Dinsay is now on here. Yeah. yeah. So, Councilor Spoon, yeah, we'll we'll reach out to him. We've we've made that a practice for our football games. Uh, we usually send the SRO out there, and he notifies them. And the last few times we've done it, he's he's been appreciative that we've come out, but he didn't last time. He said it wasn't necessary, but we will still continue to do that and let him know about are next Friday. Are there still two graduation plans that might be critical? Yes. that it's going to happen more than once. The same right, <laughs> graduation right. This day, but it's going to happen twice. That would be great. Yeah, it, right now that's the plan. It could change depending on the risk level of the county. We might be back to one, so we're hoping. We'll see. Thank you, Principal. I appreciate you. Yes, thank you. Councilor Banks, did you have something else? Uh, just uh, uh, one final point, um, other than that um, that was also going to be in my school report, the graduation ceremonies, but it'll be a quicker meeting later on. Um, I do work for the Canby School District, and I actually will not be voting on the measure. I don't um, stand to make or lose any money, regardless of how you vote, but I won't be participating in the actual vote uh, when we do vote on this. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. I think we're we're good on this one. I'm going to move us along. Um, mayor's business. Uh, I don't have any right now. Um, Clackamas County Coordinating Committee meets tomorrow night. Um, the Region One Area Commission on Transportation meets on Monday, and then my uh, liaison report with the Park Advisory Board will um, happens the Tuesday before our next meeting. So I'll have. Uh, updates at the next meeting. Um, Councilor comments and liaison reports. I'm gonna go right around um, what's on my screen, Councilor Bangs. You know, I got I got nothing. Okay. Um, we are closing out graduations next Friday. We got uh, six and 8 p.m. services planned uh, with um, uh, mask-free spectators, but uh, you have to have two tickets. You can only get it from a graduation. Thus uh, beginning to end the longest school year in recorded history. Um, and uh, school will end for all other 12 grades the following week. Um, speaking of students, I do have two students lined up to uh, serve the city on our library um, advisory board and the uh, Heritage and Landmarks Commission. Both of them are completing their applications for the city or have done so already. And uh, yeah, we did just uh, apparently hire a new superintendent, Dr. Aaron Dobbs, who is currently the assistant superintendent at Westland Wilsonville School District. And nothing to report on the library uh, group, which doesn't meet until next week. Thank you. Council President Hensley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have much to report other than a reminder that we do now have a vacancy on the Traffic Safety Commission. So um, if you're interested in partaking in all things traffic safety, please submit applications to Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Tibbles. I have nothing to report at this time, Mr. Mayor. I'm, uh, I will have meetings uh, at the end of the month and I've been playing catch up since getting back into town. So I am a little bit behind, but plan on catching up there and have something to report next meeting. Thank you. Councilor Spoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say congratulations to the class of 2021. Like Councillor Bangs, I have a child graduating this year and I'm so excited for them. It's been a long, unusual junior and senior year for them. So it's it's exciting that, that they get to celebrate. Um, I 
Also wanted to say uh, what a great job the high school theater group did. They had their first in-person play since COVID. Uh, I think Chris and I both had kids in that as well. It was the uh, Queen Jukebox, mus Jukebox musical, We Will Rock You. And it was a delight. It was an extra game of guess who's talking or singing because they had to do it with masks on. So I spent, <laughs> I spent half the play trying to figure out who was talking or singing, but they did such a fantastic job. It was a fun one. Um, I wanted to say that I'm excited. Uh, this is Pride Month and I'm excited to celebrate all of our LGBTQI plus citizens and visitors to town. Um, you're welcome here and, and I appreciate you. And um, then in terms of transit, um, the tr CAT Cambi Area Transit received a new 35 foot bus. It went into commission at 3.30 PM today for the 99 Express route. Um, the goal is actually to make sure that all of our 99 Express routes are 35 and 40 foot buses. Um, for increased capacity. So we're getting there. Um, we're in the process of transitioning to the new vendor that we approved in the last few meetings. I don't remember exactly which one it was. That new vendor doesn't start till July 1st, but we do some work with helping um, current drivers transition to the new vendor if they would like to stay with Cambi Area Transit. So we're in that process now. Um, we also now have a plan and a route and a uh, a plan for a route and a schedule for the circulator, um, which we're still on track for October 1st to launch. Um, there might still be some tweaks as we continue to engage with the new vendor employees, the businesses, um, but there is a plan right now that's in place um, that we might tweak a little bit. Also, we have a new um, opening on the Canby Area Transit Board as well. Chris, if you had any other students that were interested in boards that that did not make your two cut, I would love you to send them my way. I would love to see a student on the Canby Area Transit Board, especially now that we're approaching a circulator, which I think will be more widely used by youth as well. And so if, if you have any other names, send them my way. I would love to get um, a student engaged on Canby Area Transit Board. Um, and then finally, a question for Scott. I had some citizens reach out to me as we uh, near more and more regular openings in the city. I had some citizens ask, citizens ask me when, when the book page was canceled, it was discussed that it might be reconsidered at a future date. And some of them asked me if we were gonna reconsider that as the library opens and it can be uh, not put in bags or handed out, but out the way it has been for the last decade in the adult sections, information desk, et cetera. Is that something um, I'd like to let, yeah, if, if that's up for reconsideration or if you're, you've decided not to reconsider the action? Um. Councilor Spoon, uh, as as of right now, I hadn't um, I hadn't really given that any further consideration. Part of it was um, it was a subscription that we was it was due for renewal. If we were going to renew it, I mean, I'm sure we could restart it if we wanted to, obviously, but we didn't renew it specifically. Um, so uh, I guess I would have to revisit that. I, I don't have a great answer for you right now. Okay, well, I just had some citizens ask if once once we're open where the people won't be concerned about being put in bags for people but could be out the way it was for the last decade. So on, on the long list of other things, you in all your free time, I guess I should say, um, I'll, I'll let them know that that isn't on your agenda yet. So, all right, thank you. Um, Councilor Parker. Well, first, I want to welcome uh, Councillor Tibbetts uh, back uh, to the Valley uh, from the hot, dry, uh, arid regions of uh, Texas to uh, more moderate temperatures here. Uh, but we're glad to have you back. Um, my meetings uh, start next week, so I have uh, nothing uh, new to report. Um, and in terms of, of citizen input, and Scott, I'm sure you'll address part of this with the uh, uh, manager's report in a few minutes. Uh, but people, of course, have been asking about the splash pad. And and really, again, that's your call. That's based upon the health protocols. The thing I would ask is that we are ready. Uh, the minute that uh, the protocols are hit or, or the risk level is dropped, that we don't start planning to open at that point, that that we're ready to go and turnkey ready the second that uh, we're given permission. So that's all I had. And finally, Councilor Barwick. Thank you very much. I will have a report at the next meeting. I have nothing tonight. Great, thank you. Um, speaking of city administrator business and staff reports, uh, Mr. Archer. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Parker, you perfectly teed up my one and only uh, report I have for you this evening. I was going to talk to you about the splash pad opening. We do in fact have a plan for a grand opening date. I want to announce that to you this evening. And then I will tell you that we will be sending you some uh, follow-up information by email to invite you and let you know what's going on. And also, obviously we wanna get the word out to the community. So uh, I'm really happy to tell you that, um, well, backing up to, to your point, Councillor Parker, um, we have been struggling with the, um, uh, the guidelines pertaining to splash pads and, and other uh, types of things. Um, we, we just um, made a decision, actually just today, we kind of finalized this uh, and determined that um, we can open the, the new splash pad at uh, the Maple Street Park on Friday, June 18th. Um, we are going to put together a kind of a simple um, but uh, appropriate um, ribbon cutting ceremony that will invite all of you to, of course, mayor and council, as well as our parks and rec board um, at 4 p.m. So Friday, June 18th, uh, 4 o'clock p.m. will be our official uh, dedication of the new splash pad being our first one. It's a big deal and we want to celebrate that. I know our community is excited. Um, the, the, the date that we landed on, um, of course, we're having summer-like weather and everybody wants to go uh, play in that right now and we'd love to do that. Um, a few things on that. One, uh, the 18th is the first full day of summer break uh, for our Canby students. I believe Councillor Bang just mentioned kind of the wrapping up of the school year. I think the 17th is the last official day for, um, for any of the students. Um, so the 18th is a Friday and it's uh, it's the first official day of summer break. So it kind of is a nice kickoff. Um, uh, secondly, we're still doing some kind of uh, final run throughs. Actually, you might um, you might either drive by and see or you might hear of uh, the, the spray pad actually running and operating uh, over the next um, several days. That's kind of a final test that we have to run through to get it operational. Uh, and then lastly, yes, um, being uh, compliant with the, um, the most recent, as of today anyway, guidelines, um, we had to do some uh, work to, to prepare ourselves and that includes uh, getting some signage ready that will be posted. I don't even know if this is viewable. This is just a uh, uh, kind of a snapshot of some signage that talks about, um, we still have to advise under the current guidelines, we have to advise our, our users of that facility that they have to um, still abide by social distancing unless they're in the same um, in the same party, I guess, family party or household party. Um, at any rate, we're, we're doing some things to make sure that we're compliant. Um, perhaps the guidelines will be uh, less restrictive by two weeks from this Friday and, and it will be uh, a little bit easier to deal with. But um, we will be running the splash pad uh, every day uh, from that point forward uh, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for the remainder of the summer and then, of course, this will be an annual thing. And we, we probably will be able to get that open earlier than um, waiting until the end of the school year, uh, perhaps by Memorial Day weekend or something uh, going forward. But this year, it just with COVID stuff, as well as getting it operational the first time, it just took us a little bit to get there. But we are excited about that. So you will, be, you will all be receiving an invitation to our ribbon cutting ceremony. That's all I've got, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. Next opportunity is uh, another opportunity for citizen input. Um, Melissa, do I have anybody else that would like to address the council? We do not. Okay. Action review. All right. You have um, approved the consent agenda, remanded the decision regarding DR 20 03 CUP 20 03 back to the Planning Commission. Adopted resolution numbers 1349 and 1356, and adopted ordinance numbers 1556 and 1557. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, that's the, that concludes our June 2nd meeting. I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Motion has been made by Council President Hensley and second by Council Ferrari to adjourn. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Cambie, have a great evening.